Hello, mumblers and minute maids. My name is Tevious Guy, and back in February, I started a short channel where I started doing character design hot takes about every single League of Legends champion. And now I'm done. I've done a character design hot take about every single League of Legends champion, sometimes in multiple parts, because even on a short channel, I cannot keep things brief. Anyway, some people asked if I'd make a compilation video collecting all of them, so I did. And here it is, I guess. Good god, that was a lot of shorts. Aatrox has a really solid I have no mouth and I must scream style backstory about the terrible things being trapped in a sensory deprivation hell does to a mind. He's a soul driven mad with suffering by centuries of solitary confinement who rages against his surroundings desperate to find some way to either end the world or end himself. But his design doesn't really express the horror of his existence. Instead, he looks like a somewhat painfully generic big red angry demon man that you might see in any generic fantasy setting. And I think going hard on body horror, showing his body as a flesh puppet attached to a possessed sword that is continuously drinking blood to remake its physical vessel, which is what he is, would have made him truly unique. Riot unfortunately stuck too close to the generic original when they remade him. He has a great concept, but he ends up falling a bit flat. My grade? C. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Ari began her life as a stereotypical succubus slash seductress, draining the spirit from her victims, but over time evolved into a story of addiction. She's addicted to the draining, but hates the act of it, making her kind of a League of Legends tragic vampire character, which is pretty cool. Currently in her story, she's on a quest to find any remnants of her Vestayan tribe in order to understand her own nature and addiction. Her design uses the same cliched, boring, standard hot fantasy babe body that every other hot fantasy babe in every game uses, especially in League of Legends, which kind of sucks, but since Ari is meant to be a seductress at least, it makes some sense as an expression of her character history. Her base design and outfit are broadly speaking fine, but the darker, more feral version they've created for the Ruined King game is, to me, much more appropriate to the current state of her story and who she is as a character. My grade? B. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Akali began her life as a fairly unremarkable ninja character, but received one of League of Legends' best reworks to date, which also moved her story forward. Frustrated with being held back by the traditionalism and caution of her master Shen, she leaves her stuffy old ninja order behind and becomes a rogue assassin, killing the enemies of Balance and of Ionia from the shadows. Akali is a rebel, and her design is crafted to contrast the highly traditionalist ninja style of Shen by incorporating sports and streetwear aesthetics, as well as tattoos for the extra edginess. She looks modern, but also confident and a bit brash, which fits her character really well, and lets her represent something of a middle ground between boring old Shen and literally the Shredder Zed. It's also nice to see a female warrior character present visible hardened muscle, which shouldn't be as rare in video games as it unfortunately is. My grade? S. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Alistar is one of League's oldest champions and has had several stories over the years, but they've all broadly stuck to the enslaved bestial monster man has his humanity restored by innocent kindness story trope. To wit, Alistar is a proud minotaur who was betrayed by his people and enslaved by Noxus, until a kind-hearted servant in the arena where he was forced to fight helped him escape and find himself again. Currently, he operates as an anti-Noxus rabble-rouser while seeking to reclaim his lost honor. Design-wise, Alistar is a minotaur, and besides being purple, he's about as stereotypical of a minotaur as you're likely to get. Like most older League characters, he wasn't designed to defy archetype, but to embody it, and he certainly does that. It also means that his design is hard to criticize, except to say that he's derivative and something more interesting could be done with his basic ideas. The loincloth and shackles, for example, while they reflect his past as an enslaved gladiator, are weird things for him to keep wearing now that he's freed. What would a minotaur wear if he could choose his own fashion? Now that could be an interesting way to design a character. My grade, C. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Ah, uh, Amumu, will you ever find a friend? The answer is no. Like a lot of old League of Legends champions, Amumu is an awkward fit for the modern state of the game. In his lore, he has three origin stories, presented as various folktales about his origins, any of which may be true or part of the truth, but the end result is that he is cursed to be alone forever and to never find a friend, because that is the cruel joke of his conception. On the design front, he is 
old. His design is clunky, his model is even clunkier, and because he was made before the aesthetics of either Shirima or the Yordles were fully established in League of Legends, he doesn't look like he's from Shirima, and he doesn't look like he is a Yordle, which according to his lore, he might not be, which is weird, because he's been a Yordle since he was first introduced to the game back in 2009. The upshot of all of this is that Amumu needs an update almost more than he needs to find a friend. My grade? D. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Don't call Anivia a god, because Riot has been weirdly specific that she isn't one. Despite the lore of her and her brothers Orn and Volibear being explicitly patterned after pagan pre-Christian gods, she's very specifically a demigod who counts among her powers and responsibilities the changing of the seasons and the cycle of death and rebirth. Like most old champions, she's designed to embody an archetype more than to be original or challenging, but she does have the amusing twist of being a phoenix who is reborn from ice rather than fire, which has led to her transition smoothly from being an extra-dimensional summoned monster deity in her original lore to being an integrated ice god- oh, demigod in the Freljord today. Design-wise, Anivia is old and clunky, especially her animations show their age, and she's overall just a very basic design. She's a bird made of ice, and besides that, her only remarkable feature is a gem on her forehead. There's something to be said for simplicity, but in the modern League of Legends, Anivia looks downright basic. My grade, C. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Annie is a child who saw her stepsister die in a drowning, accidentally killed her father with fire magic, and then intentionally murdered her own stepmother in anger. In the lore, she's a semi-feral wilderness child who occasionally murders entire taverns full of people when she's not grifting them for food or clothes. In-game, she runs around looking like a modern-day schoolgirl, complete with cat ears and a plaid skirt. Like a lot of old champions, Annie was designed primarily to embody an archetype, the creepy-slash-cute gothic schoolgirl with scary magic powers, and not so much to make sense in a coherent world, and that legacy sticks with her, even though Riot have already invented a much better design for her in the Annie Origins short. Annie's anachronistic attire, say that ten times fast, is a reminder of League of Legends beginning as a silly little Warcraft mod, but in a modern-day context she just comes across as misplaced cliched, and also it is weird that a child is wearing such heavy makeup. Her updated design would be an A, but for what is actually in the game, my grade is D. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Ah, we're still waiting on that boy band, Riot. Aphelios is a moon assassin killing sun worshippers who gets magic weapons teleported to him by his extra-dimensional ghost sister. Oh, and also he drinks a special flower poison that makes him mute and leaves him in constant blinding pain, which also lets him communicate mentally with the aforementioned ghost sister in another dimension. So, a thoroughly uncomplicated character, Aphelios. Very straightforward. Design-wise, he does a decent job integrating Targronian and Lunari's style into what is ultimately a very modern-feeling character design, with its obvious inspirations from various Asian pop music aesthetics. Aphelios was clearly an attempt by Riot to bring a more slender, androgynous, pretty boy design into the game to balance out the general beefcake that prevails in its male characters, and in that, he's a very successful design. Personally, I wish that Aphelios' design would more clearly reflect the desperation and oppression of the Lunari rather than look pop star sumptuous and opulent, but otherwise, I give him a grade A. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Ash is the war mother of Avarosa, a hard-bitten, ice-born warrior leading her people towards a united future based on mutual compassion and cooperation in spite of her people's long history of raiding, infighting, and blood-soaked warrior culture. A visionary driven to exhaustion by the pursuit of her ideals, she holds the tribes of Avarosa together with both hands in the unforgiving winterlands of the Freljord. Unfortunately, she began her life as a serial numbers filed off carbon copy of the Drow Ranger from Dota, and as such is running around in a miniskirt and thigh highs with her titties out, and only a silky thin cloak to protect her from the elements. Like the other launch champions for League of Legends, Ash has the excuse that her design was conceived long before world building was a concern for the game, but her design has gotten so outdated even Riot put voice lines in the game making fun of how bad and unfitting it is. So Brom, no shirt, huh? And I don't have pants. Yay, Freljord. I love the character, but my grade for the design is F. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Ah, what praise can be given to Aurelian's soul that he hasn't given himself already? A primordial creator god space dragon responsible for kindling the stars, Aurelian's power level is so hilariously beyond anything sensible in League of Legends, it is almost comical. He is arrogant, catty, self-regarding, and utterly confident, and has both the charm and the sheer overwhelming power to back it up, although he remains really salty about that one time a bunch of uppity mortals used his vanity to trick him into wearing a mind-controlling golden crown for a bit. Design-wise, Aurelian is essentially a floating jaw and skull born atop a body of sheer cosmic 
cosmic matter and starlight, a body which is galaxies all unto itself. In-game, that scale and majesty was always going to be impossible to get across, and he looks noticeably more goofy, although in my opinion that adds a certain cuteness to his charm that doesn't hurt the character. My one critique of his design is that they probably could have gone more over the top with it given the concept, but overall, my grade is A. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Azir is a failed emperor whose refusal to free the slaves of his empire led to his rather justified betrayal at the hands of his former best friend, which messed up his self-empowering ascension ritual and ruined his entire nation. There's a moral in here somewhere. Revived from his tomb in the sands to rebuild what was lost, he has taken on the sun god form of an ascended hawk and has set out to well, hopefully not use slaves again, because that was f***ing appalling of him. Design-wise, Asir is, well, he's Horus. He's straight up a riff on Horus out of Egyptian mythology, down to the giant sun disk that acts as the ultimate monument to his power. He is every bit as derivative as Nasus and Renekton are of Anubis and Sobek, and while his originality suffers from that, his design communicates his character very well. Imperious, resplendent, regal, and commanding, Asir absolutely looks the part of a godlike emperor figure, with his armor and feather-like cloak doing a great job of emphasizing his bird aspect and making it look intimidating rather than goofy, which is harder than you'd think with birds. My grade is A. Subscribe to this channel for more character design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Bard is a cosmic entity alive since the birth of the universe who strives to maintain cosmic musical harmony by removing dissonant notes. In most cases, these are powerful magical artifacts being misused, which he takes away to put in places where they can do no more harm. Bard, being a cosmic entity, has no human voice and communicates his character entirely through design and animation, and his design wears its Studio Ghibli influences right on its oversized sleeves. The idea of Bard is that he fashioned his body from the contents of a passing musician's wagon, which I don't think quite comes across in his design, unfortunately, but what his design does have is oodles of whimsy and personality. The roundness and softness of his shapes keeps him friendly, but the stilt legs, the long horn with the bells, and his inscrutable round mask creates a certain distance that makes him inhuman and in the right or wrong light even a little bit creepy. There's an uncanniness to Bard that serves his design really well. My grade? A. Subscribe to this channel for more design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. There's no getting around that Blitzcrank is old. A launch champion who never received a rework, they are stuck deeply in a 2009 Warcraft 3 derived character aesthetic. Their model is chunky, disproportionate, clumsy to look at, and festooned with senseless spikes and bolts and weirdly distorted asymmetries that malform their already inelegant silhouette. In their story, Blitzcrank is a steam golem who gains self-awareness through a hextech experiment by Victor, and who spends their time trying with tremendous kindness and a humanitarian instinct to improve the living conditions in the poisonous Sawn slums. They are a heroic innocent, and being generous, yes, the childish cartoony proportions of the model can lend itself a little towards that concept, but their design runs on a brand of clumsy Looney Tunes physics that undercuts their story. They look silly, not clumsily innocent. Conscious of all of this, Riot has already redesigned them for Wild Rift, but until that design makes it to the main game, my grade is an F. I'm sorry, Blitz, you're a good kid. You just need some love. Subscribe to this channel for more design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Brand has never had a particularly deep story. Originally, he was an evil fire demon who possessed a pirate in order to burn the world to ashes because he's an evil fire demon. In more recent times, he has been retconned into a more emotionally complex character, a former student of Rise who got corrupted by a burning desire for power and claimed a world rune, which then turned him into an evil fire demon that wants to burn the world. Like a lot of old champions, he was originally designed to embody an archetype, not to challenge it, and consequently his design is boring. He's a charred human full of fire who throws lots of fire all around, and that's about it. The only surprising part of him is that his pants somehow haven't burned yet. He's about as basic as basic gets, and while nothing about his design is downright bad, there's equally nothing interesting to recommend about it. My grade is a D. Subscribe to this channel for more design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Brom is hard of the frail yard. Stand behind Brom, and you will be safe. Brom is from 2014, and along with the Sichuani rework, was the first emergence of the frail yard heavy leathers, angular metal, and furs aesthetic that Ash so sorely lacks. He's also an example of when weather inappropriate clothing can make sense to express a character. Legendary resilience is Brom's entire deal. He's a living folk hero whose imperviousness to damage makes him the stuff of myth and stories. So, unlike Ash, who just isn't dressed in frail yardian fashion at all, Brom 
Tom is what a Freljordian looks like when they make the decision not to wear a shirt in order to play up their legend. His design is inspired by wrestlers, especially his champion belt, and by classical circus strongmen. His bare skin and tattoos plays up the nothing can damage me carefree confidence that informs his performance of his own legend, all of which combines to make a fantastically cohesive design with a lot of obvious charm and character. My grade, A. Subscribe to this channel for more design hot takes, or head on over to my main channel to get long-form videos that discuss these subjects in detail. Old League champions are usually created to embody an archetype rather than to challenge it, but even as an exaggerated archetype, Caitlyn looks ridiculous. Her updated splash art pulls her design together better, but between the excessive cleavage, tiny dress, pointless leg straps, and absolutely cartoonishly enormous circus ringmaster top hat, she looks more like an escapee from a cancelled Animaniacs episode than a character anyone is meant to take seriously. In her lore, she's the dignified, practical, sober-minded counterpart to Vi's colorful brashness and Jinx's explosive mayhem, a stiff upper lip Sherlock Holmes slash upper-class gentlewoman detective character obsessed with checking the abuses of Piltover's imperious upper-class and keeping order. Like with Annie, Riot themselves have already Already produced a much better design for her for a cinematic, and if that was in the game, I could probably give it a B, but in the game right now, Caitlyn looks like the porn parody version of her own character design, and I have to give that an F. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. And so we come to old granny knife legs. Camille is League of Legends' first and so far only attempt at creating a female champion who appears to be over the age of, oh, 35 or so. And while I for one appreciate the stab at diversity, they also couldn't help themselves from giving her the biggest dump truck ass and the most extreme hourglass figure in the entire game and writing in some magic prosthetics that ensure she never actually ages physically beyond her hair turning white. Putting aside that personal annoyance of mine, Camille is a solid design. She's an upper-class aristocrat who assassinates anyone who threatens the power of the traditional aristocracy. A jack-booted fascist thug whose boots are made of knives to ensure that the lower clashes she steps on will die from their wounds. The knife legs also clearly communicate her stiff upper lip Victorian matriarch exacting nature, as likely to cut you off in conversation for saying something rude as she is to cut your throat for daring to be poor in her presence. I wish she was actually an old lady character, but still, my grade is A. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. The myth of Medusa the Gorgon and the myths of the half-human, half-snake Naga are not at all the same thing, but have mixed together in pop culture over time to produce characters like Cassiopeia. Currently, her lore is in a bit of a chaotic state because, on the one hand, she's the sister of Katarina, deeply tied into the politics of Noxus, and one of the instigators of Azir's revival and everything that's happening in Shurima right now. And Shurima, by the way, is the region that she looks like she's supposed to be from based on her aesthetics. But on the other hand, her storytelling focuses on her personal tragedy and the trauma of her transformation into a hideous monster, and has sort of cast her as this Batman-like Avenger in the night, protecting the innocents from the abuses of men, which ties into the Medusa part of her character and would be pretty cool if they went further with it, but who knows if they actually will. As a character design, she's fine, but it's kind of hard to evaluate her because her lore is so all over the place. Is she supposed to be a Noxian Black Rose spy operative, a Shereman monster woman, or a tragic parable about the dangers of hubris? Who knows? Hopefully Riot clarifies her someday, but my grade is B for now. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. There's a 90s comic called Spawn, where one of the villains is an odious murder clown called The Violator. Yes, that really is his name, it's very much a 90s comic. When he transforms into a demon, he looks like this. Anyway, here's Cho'Gath. Like most Void champions, Cho'Gath's lore ultimately boils down to he wants to eat and or destroy the world because cosmic horror. And as such, he is a limited instrument as a character. He pretty much only functions as a villain, monster, or antagonist, which isn't necessarily a flaw, mind you, it's just a feature of his conception. Design-wise, he is, well, he's the Violator from Spawn, and blatantly so, but being a very old champion, he also looks absolutely nothing like the modern conception of the Void Monsters, which incorporate a much more varied and interesting shape language than what he displays. Few champions in the game need a rework as desperately as Cho'Gath does, and even if he wasn't a rip-off character, he would be an F for me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Corky's biggest problem is that he is old. He launched in 2009 and has never received a proper model update, which really shows at this point. Lore-wise, Corky and the Yordles are in a semi-awkward spot, conceived both as rarely seen magically disguised cryptid elf gremlins who avoid human attention at all costs, but also somehow completely integrated into every society on Rune Terra. Consequently, it's hard to know how much of Corky's current lore, where he's a flying ace in Piltover, is really canon. 
The idea of his design is a combination crackpot old inventor grandpa with his janky flying machine held together with spit and duct tape, and a World War I flying ace obsessed with reliving his past glories. And while it does make him a compelling comedic character, it is an ambitious design to try and pull off when you're working with what looks like a Nintendo 64 level of polygon count on the model. He badly needs a rework, but while he's a bit of a mess, he is at least a charming and unique mess, so I'll say my grade is C. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. So, Darius is boring. In the lore, he's the Hand of Noxus, representing the nation's might as one-third of the Triferix Council alongside Swain, representing Vision, and definitely not LeBlanc, representing Guile. He worked his way up from a lonely orphan protecting his little brother, rose through the ranks of the military through his bravery and determination until he became a respected and tough-minded leader who only accepts the best from his troops and... <laughs> Riot has attempted multiple times to invest Darius with something resembling a personality and have only ever succeeded in making him more straight-edge and boring. This makes him an absolutely perfect contrast to his brother Draven, of course, but leaves very little interest for the man himself. And this unfortunately carries over into his character design, which is also boring. Like, yes, he has the Noxian colors and the axe and the armor design look fairly cool, but if you dump him into a fantasy Warhammer army or a World of Warcraft expansion, he wouldn't be out of place either as a personality or a design. There's a million heart-bitten, honorable, brooding warrior dudes like Darius in fantasy, and while Darius does absolutely nothing surprising or different, he is a competently executed version of what he is, which gets a B from me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ah, Diana, my favorite tragic moon lesbian. Riot has never officially confirmed that Leona and Diana are star-crossed tragic lovers, but the people who actually created those champions have publicly been extremely clear that they were supposed to be, and it was management who shut it down. In the lore, she is the aspect of the moon and guardian of a persecuted religious sect on Montargon, which puts her terminally at odds with her sunny counterpart, and the fundamental tragedy of that betrayed relationship forms the core of Diana's personality and story. If Riot had ever actually done anything with it, I suspect it could have been quite compelling, but since they haven't, Diana's lore remains a bit empty of development. As a design, she has a strong contrast with Leona, how Kopesh makes for an iconic visual weapon, the emo makeup is on point, and her forehead glowing moon tattoo is cool as hell. Outside of that, though, she barely has a costume design, and color-wise, she's so drab as to be functionally monochrome. Athelios has done a much better job of suggesting the silvery light of the moon with colors since then, and I hope that one day she gets an update that takes a cue from that. I adore her character, but as a design, unfortunately, my grade is C. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Here's a character who reminds us that League of Legends used to put out a champion every two weeks, regardless of whether they really should have. Dr. Mundo wandered fully formed out of the sketchbook of a disaffected 90s teenager trying to invent a villain for their terrible comic book, and in his time with League of Legends, the game has tried everything from making him a dangerous, violent sociopath genius to a straight-up rip-off of Bizarro from Superman. The comedy angle is the only thing that's really stuck to him because, well, just look at him, what can you do with that other than make fun of it? But his clunky ugliness has also made him one of League of Legends' number one meme characters, which I think does count for something. If I attempt to be objective about him, Dr. Mundo is a disastrous mess of deeply unacceptable quality, but he's one of those messes that has stuck around so long that you grow irrationally fond of it, even though you know it desperately needs to be tidied up. He definitely doesn't deserve it, but I'll give him a C. And yes, we'll come back around to him once his boring-ass-looking rework finally comes out. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. I talked in the Darius video about how Draven is the brother who got all the personality in their family, but perhaps Darius should count himself lucky because it turns out that personality is douchebag. Draven is the quintessential insecure man-child, a narcissistic show-off who lives entirely off attention and who will fall apart the moment he's not the center of attention in every room he walks into. You get the sense that a big part of the reason of why this is is that Darius has overshadowed him his entire life, but since Draven has never really received any meaningful attention in the lore, that's about as far as his character can really be interpreted at this point. He is League of Legends' consummate wrestling heel, and between his stupid haircut obnoxious moustache and shit eating grin, Riot absolutely nailed that part of his character design. You take one look at this man and you understand that he's a trash fire on legs and you want to go to his arena fights just to cheer for whatever face is trying to take him down because his humiliation would be so satisfying. My one complaint with Draven is that for being such a flamboyant heel, his colors and costume are far too drab. If Riot gave him a more campy villain outfit, I think he could be A tier, but for the moment, for me, he's stuck in B. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Echo has one of the best lore stories in League of Legends, where he uses his time-reversing powers to relive a perfect moment of happiness with his parents over and over again, because he's terrified to tell them that he's not going to move to Piltover to study at university, even though they saved up for his education his entire life, he's going to stay in Zaun and try to make his city a better place to live. So Echo is a good kid, who accidentally invented a way to shatter time itself, which he uses to infinitely repeat time loops, trying and failing things over and over again until he gets them perfectly right, sometimes at the cost of his own health. Design-wise, he strikes a good balance 
balance between street punk and scrappy inventor, with his tall mohawk and hourglass face paint contrasted against painfully sensible overalls and welding goggles. His bat slash club looks crafted enough to feel like a personal weapon, but also primitive enough to belong to a street kid. While I do kind of wish he had a bit more scrappy punk energy or more crazy inventor energy, like just push him a little harder in either direction, Echo is absolutely a great aid sign for me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Say it with me, kids. League characters are often created to embody archetypes rather than to challenge them. And this is extremely true of Elise, who is literally every femme fatale slash black widow trope rolled into one. Her story is tropey as well. She's a beautiful high society Noxian socialite hungry for power and influence who falls in with a secret Illuminati cabal who dispatch her to the haunted Shadow Isles to look for a powerful artifact. Instead of finding that, she gets bitten by an ancient spider god who transforms her into an ageless transforming black widow monster girl who uses her big mommy m her charms to lure thirsty men and women to her spider god as sacrifices. Design-wise, Elise is a sexy femme fatale MILF with all that that entails, and while it is absolutely tropey, cheesy, and overplayed, it is hard to argue that it isn't effective at what it does. Legends of Runeterra tried to tone her down a little bit, but I feel like if you're going to have a bondage-themed spider seductress thirst trap in your video game, it's more honest just to own it and go all out on the horny. I think there are ways to make a more interesting version of what Elise is, like bringing in more BDSM influence or leaning into queer aesthetics or sexuality, but my grade is still a B. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. I'm somewhat known for being negative on female character designs that sexualize characters for no goddamn reason, hello Ash and Kaisa, but Evelyn is the exact opposite of that. A primordial pain demon who extracts energy from people's misery, she has found that a great way to maximize people's suffering is to inflict agony when they are at the peak of their bliss so that they have much further to fall. To that end, Evelyn takes on an obscenely seductive form, pandering to the most hedonistic desires of her victims to make their pain all the more delicious. Now, this is a tropey sexpot femme fatale character, absolutely, and it's valid to criticize it as such, but it's a really good version of one of those, which knows what it is and isn't afraid to own. It. In my opinion, the horniness here works in service to the character rather than as a distraction or a detriment. My big complaint with Evelyn is that they should at least have the ability to also appear as an ultra horned up masculine character, and if she could appear as many different genders, body types, and types of sex appeal, they would absolutely be S tier because, you know, human sexual appetite is a boundless ocean of diversity, and Evelyn is only really appealing to a small puddle of it right now. Still, she does that really well, so my grade is B+. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Even on Runeterra, you are not safe from smug, overcompensating e-boys. Ezreal is Indiana Jones by way of a YouTube influencer, and I don't mean that necessarily as an insult. He's the child of famous archaeologist explorers who vanished on an expedition, and he took up exploring primarily as a means of dealing with that trauma, telling himself that if he can just get famous enough for his discoveries, then maybe his parents will finally come home. So all his smugness, narcissism, and desperation to show off ultimately comes from a fairly vulnerable place, a child blaming himself for being abandoned by his parents, which, how? For me, that level of psychological insight into what can cause a person to be like Esriel makes him a lot more interesting and sympathetic and tolerable. As a character design, he's pretty simple, focused around his gauntless face markings and poofy anime hair for recognizability with otherwise perfectly sensible understated fashion choices. I think this does a good job of straddling the line between Esriel actually being a good explorer on a practical level while also being a loudmouth show-off. He could be a bit more interesting, but he gets a solid B from me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Fiddlesticks not only steals Nocturne's lunch money, it sends Nocturne to culinary school so it can make lunch for Fiddlesticks for the rest of its life. Fiddlesticks is ancient beyond most cognition, possibly coming into existence in the first primal scream of creation, as old as the universe itself. It is a fear demon which has stalked the world so long that every species fears the mention of its names. In the lore, Fiddlesticks occupies a special position as perhaps the oldest and most important demon mired in a number of eldritch mysteries related to the keys it carries and its place in the cosmology of Arunterra's reality. As a character design, Fiddlesticks is about as good as it gets. The body itself is merely a puppet cobbled together from scrap metal and farm equipment, with Fiddlesticks' actual essence hiding inside the cage at its center, from which spawn its horrifying crow storms. Its design is asymmetrical and unhinged, its animations are jerky, sudden, and counterintuitive, it has too many arms where it really shouldn't, and I don't think I can give enough props to the voice actor for the way that this thing sounds. Yeah, S. Obviously S. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ah, Fiora, proof that even Runeterra is not safe from the terror of French-English accents. Fiora is the most accomplished duelist in Demacia, a girl who has defied gender stereotypes her entire life and takes over stewardship of her noble house after tragically murdering her own father in a duel to expunge the shame of a big political scandal that he caused. Her story is rather convoluted and full of circuitous political skullduggery, and the character it produces is kind of boring. Fiora is mostly just stereotypically steely and determined and obsessed with honor and doing the right thing by her house and yada yada yada. There's not really any surprises here. Design-wise, the story is much the same. Fiora 
Sora as a duelist, and that's what she looks like with her shoulder guard rapier and absolutely incredible posture. She's a formal honor-obsessed noble, and that's what she looks like with her cape, gold, white colors, and formal outfit. Her black hair with a single-colored streak is, again, kind of a played-out visual trope, but it does at least offer her head a detail of contrarian interest to match her contrarian nature. Yeah, I don't know, it's hard to say much about a sensible design that's executed competently. My grade is a B-, minus, I guess. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Once upon a time, Fizz was a member of a water-dwelling race of creatures whose civilization simply vanished, leaving him their sole survivor. Eventually, Riot decided that plotline wasn't gonna go anywhere, and so they retconned him into a yordle, which he doesn't really look like. Nowadays, he's the resident trickster goblin of Bilgewater, causing trouble for the residents on a scale from mild inconvenience all the way up to accidentally sinking entire ships full of sailors. He's become a folk hero to children and a terror to the adults, and he's drawn to civilizations by a deep and desperate need for companionship, without which he will quite literally fall into a coma. He causes trouble for the Biltwater Pirates, but he really just wants friends. Design-wise, Fizz is a really solid little design for an ocean-bound amphibious species. He incorporates aspects from amphibians, fish, lizards, and cephalopods, and it works really well. He doesn't, unfortunately, look much like a yordle except in his proportions, and there's nothing in his design to connect him to Biltwater except looks ocean-like. Legends of Runeterra has introduced a number of sea creatures that complement his design, and that helps, but I think this is a C. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Galio is one of those champion reworks that essentially deleted an old character and fully replaced it with a new one, and consequently some League fans have mixed feelings about him. In the lore, he's a colossus, a giant statue created by a legendary artificer composed of magic-absorbing materials. He comes to life when exposed to sorcery and fights to protect the Damasians who carry him into battle. Being conscious even when not animated, he sees their lives pass around him through the centuries and has grown very fond of them. He has a special relationship with Lux, who's powerful enough to bring him to life all on her own, but because his agency as a character is contingent on other people bringing him to life, his lore is ultimately kinda limited. Visually, he's probably the most Damasian-looking thing in the entire game. Sheer white and gold, all stoic with heroic sculpted angles, an exact image of the self-serious awe with which Damasians view themselves. He's a bit of a punchy himbo as a personality, and that comes across brilliantly in his exuberant animation and big, broad features. While he has his limitations, and I miss old Galio too, I can't think of a reasonable way to improve him, so I have to rank him an S. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Gangplank is a pirate, and in some ways, that's about it. He's the League of Legends version of Blackbeard, a ruthless, singularly determined privateer who rules, or ruled, Biltwater with an iron fist, taking everything and giving away nothing. He was unseated spectacularly by Misfortune, the only ever in-game event that actually disabled a champion from play because he had been, air quotes, killed, and now he rebuilds his power in secret, preparing to take back his lost empire and take revenge for the arm he lost in his defeat. Design-wise, Gangplank is a pirate. Flintlock, gun, big cutlass, big hat, big beard, pirate. He is, you might say, a character designed to embody an archetype rather than to challenge it. What makes him stand out is first of all his prosthetic robot arm, which is like a cool thing to add to any pirate, frankly, and his naked torso and tattoos give him more of a scrappy fighter feel than the untouchable pirate lord he used to be, and as a duo with Captain Misfortune, that makes him a solid exemplar of the dynamic of Bilgewater. He's a very solid design, executed extremely well, and while I wish he was a bit more original, I'll still give it an A. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Garen is to Damasia as Darius is to Noxus, an exemplar of the region's ideals at their best, saddled with the problem that being an exemplar also makes you generic. Garen is the brother of Lux, scion of the prestigious Crown Guard family, and thoroughly the lapdog of the Damasian regime ordered around by the new King Jarvan, but much more insidiously manipulated and dominated by his awful aunt Tiana. He's torn between his ideals and his desires, honor bound to defend his nation but pitted by fate against his own family and... <laughs> Even with League of Legends' first novella under his belt, his story is stuck in a perpetual holding pattern, waiting for this hurricane himbo to finally make a goddamn decision. Garen is both in personality and design about as generic as fantasy gets. Big, burly, short-haired white dude with big pauldrons and an even bigger sword is peak fantasy hero 101 design. The fact that his lore places him firmly on the side of a genocidal regime of anti-magic eugenicists does add a bit of spicy subversiveness to his vibes, but even though being a generic fantasy hero is part of the point of the character, that doesn't make his design any less boring. This is a C for me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Nar is a prehistoric yordle who was frozen in ice when Lissandra trapped the Watchers in the Howling Abyss. Now, some thousands of years later, he roams the Frel Yord doing cave yordle stuff, teetering between the first inklings of existential angst that his world and everyone he ever knew was gone, and exuberant, unfrozen caveman wonder at this new world he finds himself in. Nar is an example of the trope that prehistoric peoples were innocent and simple-minded like children, which as a historian I have kind of a problem with for many reasons I won't go into here, but in League of Legends he's just one more messed up piece in the mixed up bag of jigsaw puzzles that are the yordles. His design leans on a duality, the overwhelming childlike adorable 
horribleness of his base form contrasted against the kick your ass brutal monster of his enraged form. And as a design concept, it's executed really well, using the blue accent on his fur and his skull helmet as a through line to identify the giant red monster with a tiny orange yordle. It's a perfectly sensible design executed well, but it relies on some bad tropes about what it means to be air quotes uncivilized, supporting a story that feels like a go nowhere dead end. My adorable child deserves better lore, but I'll be nice and say B plus design. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Gragas is the character design equivalent of a fart joke. He's a misshapen lump in a loincloth on giant feet that body slams its fat belly around, sloppily sucking down beer and burping loudly every 10 seconds. More recently in the lore, Riot has tried to gentle him a bit. Nowadays, he's a brewmaster obsessed with making the perfect beer who is nominally aligned with the Avarosans, but who travels the frail yard looking for good brews and better ingredients. It's a good concept for a character. He has a half-decent story on the universe page, but there's a reason subjectively did a rework of this guy. His design is terrible. Putting aside the fact that he runs around glaciers in a loincloth, which, ugh, his design is simply ugly, and not just in terms of polish and polygon count. With its flattened head, fat lips, sloppy gut, and wild disproportionality, the design itself sees and presents Gragas only as a juvenile, haha, fat ugly man is gross joke. It doesn't present him as a brewmaster, it doesn't even present him as a person, just as an ugly thing to laugh at. And that's a f F minus from me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in depth videos. Graves is a cowboy with a shotgun who runs schemes with his pirate gambler boyfriend. That's a pretty solid start to any character biography. Like Leona and Diana, Graves and Twisted Fate had a heavy internal push at Riot to make them canonically bitter exes and then later reconcile boyfriends. Management has always said no, but I've decided to ignore them because they suck. After being instrumental in Gangplank's downfall, Graves is running schemes and scams and bounties in Built Water with Twisted Fate, and the two of them have been involved in a truly astounding amount of lore in the game's history. He's a gruff, rough and tumble classic outlaw character acting as the muscle in most situations, perpetually frustrated by the flighty magic fancies and convoluted plans plans of his partner. Design-wise, Graves is very much a Western movie archetype, the wandering outlaw looking for vengeance, and he fills that niche nicely with his poncho, chaps, mutton chops, and overcompensatingly enormous shotgun. This makes him a solid visual duo with Twisted Fate, albeit in some parts he feels like an awkward fit for Bilgewater with its 17th century pirate fashion and Pacific Islander aesthetics. Still, he's recognizable and perfectly functional, so I guess B-? Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Hecarim is one of the OG Shadow Isles champions, once upon a time acting as a dark messenger, terrifying the world with portents of doom. In recent times, though, things have got a bit more complicated. TLDR, Hecarim was a corrupt knight who served the ruined king and was instrumental in bringing about the ruination that corrupted the Blessed Isles, and now he acts as a vanguard for the assaults that the Black Mist mounts on the rest of the world, riding out to destroy the living. He is also responsible for murdering Callista. Design-wise, Hecarim is a centaur. In the lore, he was a knight who fused with his warhorse and death, but in-game, well, he's a centaur. He's very much fun time before League of Legends had a coherent aesthetic for the Shadow Isles, and so he's a pretty generic undead bad guy. His armor is black, he's covered in random skulls and spikes all over the place, he's got sharp toothed ghost faces on his chest and legs, and a really ugly face on his helmet that makes him look more goofy than scary. He's overall a very Warcraft 3 looking mess, with no interesting direction and no unique design ideas. It's a D for me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Heimerdinger is more complicated than he really should be, specifically because he's a Yordle. Some parts of lore insist that he and Zig lived in Piltover only by obsessively maintaining a magical glamour concealing their non-human nature, but Legends of Runeterra has a statue of Heimerdinger in full Yordle mode, ten foot tall, planted outside Piltover University. Hmm. Anyway, lore-wise, Heimerdinger is a combination crackpot inventor, distracted professor, and mad scientist, holding a residency as the foremost hex-tech genius of Piltover, forever churning out robots and inventions and delving deep into the mysteries of science, while occasionally training an assistant by having them test his inventions. He has unquestionably some of the the most charming animation in the game, with his giant head bobbing around as he goes, and it's a pity his lore isn't more intensively explored. As a design, he uses his giant poof of hair to make his head and big brain look even bigger visually, to the point that in-game you can barely see his body at all. His welding goggles, magnifying glass, and wrenches do a good job of selling him as a combat engineer, and my main critique is I think he could wear something to look a little bit more like either a workman's overalls or a professorial lab coat. Still, my grade is an A. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Hey, remember that one time League of Legends tried to do something interesting with a female character's body type? Ilawi is the priestess of a religion that worships Naga K. Boris, a tentacular kraken god that preaches the pursuit of desire above all else. Not necessarily hedonism, mind, but Ilawi is pretty vocal about how hard she wants to bone with Braum, which, full respect. As a personality, she's direct, forceful, and deeply believes in tests of strength and fortitude, which she administers in the name of her terrifying elder god. Design-wise, Ilawi fulfills her lore purposes admirably, if in a slightly understated way. World the priestess of a Pacific Island-slash-Mesoamerican-inspired 
religion who hangs out in the pirate city? Yeah, sure, that's what this looks like, even if perhaps it could stand to be a bit more colorful and ostentatious. Beyond that, Ilawi is unique simply by virtue of her body shape, and she's unique not only in League of Legends, but in fantasy video games and, like, in media in general, because female characters usually simply aren't allowed to be built like a brick mm. house in this way. In my opinion, that kind of design diversity has value for its own sake, but in this case, it also fits her character perfectly, so S rank all the way. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Irelia is a blade dancer and an unlikely leader and figurehead of the military resistance against Noxus. Deeply fatigued by the war and elevated to a position of leadership she's uncomfortable with, she now tries to navigate the increasingly complex power dynamics of Ionia and try to find some way to bring her homeland back to harmony. She's also responsible for cutting off Swain's arm, setting the stage for him to bond with a demon and become the tyrant of Noxus. As a design, Irelia is meant to be a dancer who has found a way to use her art to control blades on the battlefield, but it's a bit messy. Her armor is full of weird Ionian curves and sharp edges that just look like they make it impossible to move freely, and her clothes underneath seem to be an extremely tight-fitting spandex that offers no protection. Her costume is stuck in this awkward middle point where she looks like neither a battlefield warrior nor a free-flowing dancer, and leaves her looking sleek and pretty, but absent of a clear design identity. The best idea of her design is the scarves attached to her wrists, because they at least communicate something like a fluid artistic motion, but yeah, no, this is really just kind of a mess. My grade is like a D+. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ivern has a convoluted, and in my opinion rather unnecessary, backstory about once upon a time being a brutal warlord who cuts down a special magic tree which then does a karmic punishment on him by turning him into a special magic tree, and it kinda doesn't go anywhere interesting or lead to any meaningful impact for the character that he becomes. The end result, though, is an immensely charming, whimsical, unique, and interesting creature, Ivern the Green Father, who's friend and guardian of all nature's children, a combination old hippie cool uncle and David Attenborough on weed. As a design, Ivern is essentially a tree ant, but designed after slender, thin, and flexible trees like willow and birch rather than the typical brick Whoa! house designs you see on characters like, say, Maokai. And that reedy flexibility ties in perfectly with his whimsical, mild-mannered personality as well. And the absolute playful joy with which he's animated doesn't hurt either. He's meant to embody the cycle of nature, and I wish that his design engaged a little bit more with the dark side of that cycle, which is death and decay, but my grade for Ivern is still an A+. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Janna has an odd history with the game. For the longest time, she was a street kid turned sorcerer from Sawn, mastering wind magic, who had become a sort of quasi-semi-wind elemental herself. But in more recent times, Riot has remade her as a wind spirit slash demigod, once revered by the sailors of Runeterra, who fell out of favor with seafarers, but found a new home as a goddess of fresh air in the place that needs it the most, the poisoned slums of Sawn. Now, on the one hand, that's a genuinely very clever way to create a wind god character who's more likely to pray to her than those who desperately need breathable air. But on the other hand, Janna, like Ash and Caitlyn, was designed first and foremost to be fantasy-themed eye candy, and very little attention was paid to any other aspect of her character design. Consequently, she doesn't look like a spirit or god of wind, either guiding sailors to safe harbor or purifying the toxic gray mists of Swan. She looks like a floating elf in a bikini, nothing more and nothing else. And although the sexualization doesn't necessarily hurt the character, it's so 1980s pinup vanilla boring that she'd frankly be a more interesting design if she was just like straight up naked. Plus, her hair looks ridiculous. This is a great F from me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ah, Javan, the f boy who would be king. Explaining the Demacia storyline in a short is next to impossible, but TLDR, Jarvan is both presiding over a massive systemic campaign of extermination of mages and magical creatures, and he's trying to get it in with Shivana, a person who his kingdom would imprison and execute at the drop of a hat if she wasn't useful. So, with a massive moral hypocrisy at the core of his character arc, Jarvan certainly lives up to the title of Exemplar of Demacia. Bit of a pity that his character design doesn't. Jarvan is an old champion added to the game long before Demacia fully emerged as League of Legends Gondor, all sheer white walls and gleaming gray steel. But even in the olden days, I gotta say that those spiky yellow shoulder pads and bizarre black body condom, I mean, what even is that, look far more like a low-budget Warcraft 3 cosplay than a fearsome warrior or a respectable leader. Legends of Runeterra recently sleeked it up to look a lot less stupid, but it still looks utterly out of step with the region of which he's supposed to be the ascending monarch, and that extendo flag and dash whip spear weapon belongs on a cheesy anime protagonist, not a Demacian king. This is a D- from me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Jax is another odd duck surviving from the early days of League of Legends. Once upon a time, he was an unbeatable Grandmaster who fights with a lamppost merely to give his opponents a fighting chance. Now he's a rare survivor of Ikathia, a nation that unleashed the Void to fight back against the tyranny of Shirima, and in so doing destroyed itself and possibly the entire world eventually. Now he travels Rune Terra, looking for capable warriors to defend the world against extra-dimensional horrors, and his lamppost is now an elemental torch, burning with a magical fire that can truly harm the Void. Being completely covered up, Jax's design is almost entirely made of his costume, which looks far more I.O 
Draconian than any kind of Shuriman, especially with a Master Yi visor and sandals. Oddly, he has three fingers and two toes, leading some fans to speculate that he's meant to be a unique species, like a sand troll, although that's never been expanded upon. His look does make him appropriately enigmatic, and while I think his designs should really incorporate details, trinkets, and bits from all over his world wandering, and it should connect him more clearly to Ekathia, it's not like his design doesn't work, it's just old. My grade is a C+, I guess? Maybe B- if you had a real weapon. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Jace is a champion a lot like Demacia. Once upon a time a fairly uncomplicated good guy squaring off against obvious evil, various lore retcons have since turned him into a bit of an ethically compromised asshole swimming in a sea of grey morality. Jace is League of Legends' Tony Stark, a natural genius driven to arrogance and a superiority complex by his gifts and privileges. He becomes a classic insufferable genius who finds a lone friend and the only man with an intellectual ego big enough to match him, Victor. They're both obsessed with improving on the faults of humanity, but come to blows when Victor wants to turn everybody into transhuman cyborgs, free will optional, and Jace thinks maybe that's going a little bit too far, actually. A big epic science fight ensues, resulting in Jace building a Hextech hammer to become a superhero and marginally less of a jerk. As a design, Jace is Elon Musk's fursona, basically. A handsome, charming, sexy tech hero with some cool armor and a cool weapon, all fairly well composed and visually interesting to look at. For all that I poke fun at him, I also can't really find any fault with Jace, except that maybe he feels a little bit basic at times. I guess my grade is an A-? minus. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Jin is a legendary serial killer with a flair for the theatrical, arch-nemesis of both Shen and Sed, who kills his victims in spectacularly choreographed explosions of violence and precision. He is as perverse and twisted as he is enigmatic and mysterious, killing for reasons only he knows. His design uses asymmetry to create tension and a mask to create mystery and is uncanny and immaculate from head to toe. My grade is an uncomplicated S. Jinx is an unhinged, chaos-obsessed explosion fanatic, spreading mayhem for no reason except the sheer fun and joy of doing it. Or is she? There's an animated series in the works that explores Jinx's origins as the much more meek-looking little sister of Vi, which is probably going to expand a lot on the character. But suffice it to say that there's always seemed to be some method to her madness and obsession with the pink-haired Piltover Enforcer. My personal headcanon? She's just being a wingman, committing crimes so Vi and Caitlyn have to spend time together and eventually, finally, kiss. Design-wise, Jinx is one of the game's first real attempts to diverge from the hourglass busty fantasy babe archetype, all skinny and wiry and flat as a board. She also uses asymmetry, thigh-high socks and tattoos on one side and a purple and black color split to add to her unbalanced taste aesthetic, and along with Vi, she represents the first real push of punk aesthetics into Piltover and Sawn, which works quite brilliantly. Jinx remains unique in League of Legends and became essentially the official mascot for Wild Rift due to her popularity, which in this case is quite obviously earned. It's a grade S from me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Oh, is it time for my monthly 4 o'clock complaining session already? Kaisa is the lone survivor of a void attack on a Shuriman village. Commonly understood to be Kazadin's lost daughter, she accidentally formed a symbiotic bond with a void creature that allows her to survive in void-infested areas and even fight back. Due to that infestation, however, she's forever doomed to be seen by her countrymen as just another monster, hated and reviled even as she risks her life defending and warning them. She has spent most of her life in a desperate struggle to survive and push back the void's encroachment on Shurima inch by inch, a ruthless predator hunting ruthless predators. Which is expressed in her character design by making her look like Scarlett Johansson in a body condom. Kaisa is not only physically unblemished, unwounded, and unscarred, she also has immaculately maintained hair and makeup on point. How the hell are you gonna tell me that Shuriman's are scared of this lady when she just looks like a normal-ass lady in a suit, which putting us- Yeah, I went on like this for quite a while, but it's a D-minus grade only because I think her shoulder pods are really cool and work really well. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Absolutely no problem giving her six miles of cleavage and big titty because let's prioritize Callista is a general of Camavor, the kingdom of the Ruined King. She journeyed to the Blessed Isles that the king's wife may be healed in its waters, and when Viego orders her to conquer and murder on the Isles to secure the cure, she refuses, which leads quite immediately to her betrayal and murder by Hecarim. She dies swearing revenge and returns to consciousness as a wraith of vengeance, single-mindedly consumed with the punishment of traitors. Now, if a mortal desires revenge, Callista can be called upon with a ritual to deliver it at the price of becoming one with her, a part of the Spear of Vengeance. 
Design-wise, Callista is one of the few League women not designed with beauty or attractiveness as a primary design goal, which instantly makes her unique in the game. She's gaunt, emaciated, and wired with taut muscle and bony hands. She looks the part of the obsessive wraith quite brilliantly, and really, the only thing I'd want to see is have her stab wounds in her back, the symbols of her betrayal, be actual lethal physical wounds rather than just ethereal ghost spears. Still, this is an A plus for me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Karma is League of Legends Dalai Lama, although for obvious reasons Riot will never call her that. Embodying the spiritual traditions of Ionia, Karma's story, like everyone else in Ionia's, is about dealing with the traumatic fallout of the Noxian invasion that shattered the country and its traditions. The traditions of Ionia demand pacifism, but Noxian imperialism and their chemical weapons of mass destruction demand a military response. Karma eventually relents to this need and destroys an entire Noxian armada with her formidable powers. Interestingly, while originally she was deeply traumatized by this and retreated back into conservative pacifism to restore spiritual balance, a more recent update retconned her so that she is in fact acting in accordance with the Ionian spirit, which is pushing her to action, even if it means breaking with tradition. Design-wise, Karma is every other hot League of Legends lady, a completely generic fantasy babe character, albeit with cool-looking costume. The double jade dragons orbiting in her floating wings are a cool motif, and there's lots of interesting asymmetry in her costume, albeit it has maybe slightly a too modern stylistic sense rather than traditional. Seriously though, put her outfit and haircut on Nidalee and nobody would be able to tell the difference. I have to say C-. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Now here's a complicated one. Karthus is a poor child of Noxus, raised among the squalor and death of poverty, and he becomes fascinated with the process and ritual and nature of death, to the point where he obsessively watches over the dying to see their last breath escape their lips, hoping to catch the liminal moment between life and death and glean its wisdom. He works his way up from a gravedigger to a temple scion, and no surprise to anyone, he eventually finds his way to the Shadow Isles, where his singular obsession with death allows him to transcend the murderous effects of the Black Mist and become an undead lich, singing mournful dirges for the passing of souls as he ushers them from the misery of life into the sweet release of death. Design-wise, Karthus is a pretty classic fantasy lich, but spiced up by the religious aspect of his concept. He's clearly based on bishops and preachers. I always appreciate a good subversion of Christian aesthetics, and the vibrant crimson of his robes gives an aspect of bloody vitality to his design that clashes really nicely with the usual teal and green aesthetics of Shadow Isles Undead. While Karthus isn't exactly reinventing the wheel of his archetype, he's a damn good execution of what he's meant to be, and my grade is a microphone emoji. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Kazadin is a former desert adventurer and mercenary who falls in love and raises a family with a woman of the desert tribes. One day he returns to find his village and child lost to an attack from the void, and Kazadin becomes consumed with thoughts of revenge, vowing to hunt down and slay Malzahar, whom he holds personally responsible for the spread of the void. Irony is, Kazadin's daughter is still alive. She's called Kaisa and could probably help him survive in the void better, but that would require Riot to do anything with either of their characters, so womp womp. Anyway, journeying into the void is slowly corrupting him inside and out, despite the protection of his many arcane artifacts. Oh hey, here's a picture of Kaisa looking completely normal again. How did that get there, and while his days are numbered, his burning hunger for revenge keeps him going. Design-wise, Kassadin is one part cultist priest of Cthulhu, one part Dark Templar, and one part sexy cosplay pinup model. His design is very old and out of step with modern League aesthetics, and his layered skirt, which was originally designed so the animators didn't have to give him legs, looks particularly silly nowadays. But his helmet is iconic, laser wrist blades are cool, and he's not, like, actively dysfunctional, so I'll give him an anger emoji. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Katarina is the wayward daughter of the Noxian Ducoteau assassin dynasty, a loose cannon who refuses to play by the rules and who will do anything to get the job done. Insubordination in Noxus, however, is a quick way to get yourself killed, and after a botched mission, her own father sends Talon to kill her for her disobedience. This is the source of the scar across her eye. Katarina isn't about to go down so easily, though, and instead becomes essentially a rogue agent, killing the enemies of Noxus and the people that Noxus is sending to kill her in an effort to prove herself as the greatest assassin in the world. Also, she's <laughs> Garen, I guess because Katarina's king is pecking vanilla himbo idiots with commitment issues, which, hey, valid. Anyway, design-wise, Katarina is about as basic as Garen is, really. She's a fantasy babe in leather pants with a bunch of cleavage and big knives, and also she's a redhead, so if you're doing the fantasy femme fatale bingo, that's probably a full row right there. I'd like to say more snarky things about her design, but she's honestly just so by the numbers and basically competent that there aren't any interesting jokes to make. Katarina is cool and badass and basic and boring, and I'll grade that with a white bread and knife emoji. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. I have a full What's the Deal video on Kale's design on the main channel, but TLDR. Kale is the child of a celestial Targonian aspect of justice, obsessed with punishing evildoers and upholding laws and order, no matter how repressive and harmful it may be. In pursuit of this, she has spent centuries attempting to purify herself of human weaknesses and fully ascend as an aspect. Unfortunately, half of that power belongs to her opposite twin Morgana, who thinks that you shouldn't execute people for jaywalking, actually, no matter what the law says. No surprise that Kale is very much the patron angel of the government of Demacia, with some vague hints in the story that she and Morgana might come out of hiding to intervene in the Mage Rebellion, which could be interesting. Design-wise, 
Kale is a pretty basic avenging angel with a chest plate that will literally stab her in the sternum if she tries to bend over, and exactly the same fantasy bait body type as like 40 other female League of Legends champions. She has a cool idea in that she changes her character design as she levels up and becomes ever more the dispassionate avenging angel, except Riot made her take her helmet off and look more human as she goes instead of using her armor to dehumanize her, which I find kind of baffling. Anyway, the end result is that Kale is boring and was cooler pre-rework, which gets a white cop lady emoji from me. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. You want League of Legends Sasuke? We've got League of Legends Sasuke. Kane is a disciple of Sed's Order of the Shadows, who on Sed's orders recovered a cursed scythe that makes him an incredibly powerful fighter at the cost of leaving him in a constant struggle with Rast, the Darken that resides within and who is always looking for the chance to take over. Kane, perhaps uniquely among mortals, can win that conflict and take the Darken weapon's power for his own, becoming a full-fledged shadow assassin. He can also lose and unleash Rast upon the world once more, complete with additional shadow powers, which is probably bad. Design-wise, Kane is League of Legends Sasuke. He is very explicitly and intentionally the edgy anime boy with a shirt off struggling with a dark demon inside him that threatens to take him over. He's designed to embody this archetype, not to challenge it, and this basically explains every design decision on his character, from the blue streak in his hair, to the single red eye, to the badass dark and armor corrupting him, to the fact that he runs around the rift shirtless, to the literal Sephiroth transformation he gets from ascending to Shadow Assassin, turning all the edge and emo dials up to 11. Kane is hardly original in any aspect, but he's good at being what he is, and so I'll grade him with an angry devil emoji. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Rast is a Darken, which means that once upon a time he was one of the Ascended of Shirima, ruling over the war hosts of that conquering empire, whose immortal life and unfathomable trauma battling the Void exposed him to infinite opportunities for corruption. With the fall of Shirima and the vanishing of Asir, the Ascended descended into sectarian violence and civil war, and a combination of abuse of blood magic and centuries upon centuries of warfare and bloodshed transformed them into demonic corruptions of their original selves. The former aspect of Twilight, the one before Zoe, eventually tells mortals how to seal the immortal Darken away in the very weapons they use. And this is the fate of Rast, his ceiling leading to eventual rediscovery by Kane and a chance to escape his maddening imprisonment and bathe in blood once again. Design-wise, Rast, like Aatrox, is an incredibly basic demon, all metallic spikes, angry red flesh, and sharp edges. The Ionian pants he inherits from Kane do give him a bit more of an Oni-like aspect, which is cool, but like Aatrox before him, Rast does very little to step outside of his archetype. For my money, though, he is a cooler demon design than Aatrox overall, so my grade is a smiling devil emoji. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Kennen is an incredibly important character who Riot likes to completely ignore for some reason. Essentially one of the founders of the King Ku Order, Kennen's role as Heart of the Tempest casts him as the keystone that preserves the balance in the Order. He has lived in Ionia for basically a millennium and played his role for centuries, but despite his incredibly central role in this part of Ionian lore, he has never shown up as a character in any of the major published media like comics or narrative animated shorts. As a design, Kennen is a short Yordle ninja. He's from 2010, and so from a time before a lot of what League of Legends world would become had solidified. But as it happens, his particular generic ninja costume and color scheme has lined up pretty well with the direction Ionian aesthetics were going to take anyway. While his model is showing its age, it's not outdated or dysfunctional, and his theme and powers remain unique in the game, so there's not really that much reason to update him, I guess. I wish Riot would let him play a real part in the Shen Z Akali Jin lore and the Kinku lore in general, but my grade is a ninja and shrug emoji. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Kha'Zix is underdeveloped as part of League of Legends lore. TLDR, he's a void monster who eats things and that makes him evolve to be stronger. One day Rengar fights him and it's a real tough fight and Kha'Zix is like, oh boy, that Rengar is real strong so I'm gonna be obsessed with eating him now. And no joke, that's the extent of Kha'Zix's lore. Like Rek'Sai and Cho'Gath, Kha'Zix is a limited instrument as a character by his nature. He's a void monster who kills people and that's kind of the long and short of it. And most of the real storytelling he enables is as an equal foe and dark mirror opposite to Rengar, enabling his relentless quest to hunt the most dangerous game. Design-wise, Kha'Zix is one part praying mantis, one part jewel wasp, and one part barely dodging a copyright infringement lawsuit from the Disney Corporation who own the Alien franchise nowadays. His design works just fine as a fusion of space-like void monster and animal aesthetics, and while I wish Riot would rework old champions to play with the non-Euclidean void madness they show in their concept art, Kha'Zix is cool and iconic as he is. My grade is a knife and an arrow pointing at a cat. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. The Kindred is the collective noun for Lamb and Wolf, twin embodiments of death who usher the expired out of the realm of life. Lamb, the gentle hunter offering a swift and merciful end to those who accept death, and Wolf, the brutal devourer, chasing down and inevitably consuming those who fight and run from their final end. As we've learned in Legends of Runeterra, Lamb and Wolf are only one among many embodiments of death, and they exist in part because living creatures believe they exist. Lamb and Wolf themselves have a sibling-like relationship with the gentle Lamb often calming the impatient Wolf and telling him stories to distract him 
from his hunger, with one story implying that Lamb and Wolf were once one entity but split into two so that they would always have a friend. As a design, the Lamb and Wolf are a simple concept. Lambs and wolves are popular embodiments of innocence and cynicism, gentleness and brutality. They have a yin-yang theme going on. Lamb is small and physical, wolf is huge and ghostly, lamb is ranged, wolf is melee, lamb is white, wolf is black, and each wears the mask of the other to symbolize their interconnectedness. They are simple and iconic and both endearing and deeply disturbing. My grade is... Rear forward, Brigadier Admiral Kled is a Yordle who makes his home in the Noxian hinterlands. He's hung around the Noxian tribe since before the founding of the Empire, and like a lot of Yordles, he has absorbed the general spirit of his region, which in this case has turned him into a screaming, brawling hillbilly who wants everyone and everything to get off his property. Nice burn on imperialism there. Lord Colonel Major Centurion Kled is joined by his Dracolops, Skarl, who is as immortal and indestructible as he is stupid and cowardly, making him probably the perfect foil for the violent lunatic he carries into battle. As a design, Lieutenant Sergeant Commodore Kled is mostly quite understated, wearing a fairly sensible dark combat uniform and hat, balanced out by his enormous bushy white face, huge mouth, scars, and glowing eye. That face makes him tremendously expressive and highly appealing. Skarl is much more colorful, and with his huge floppy crest ears and prehensile tongue, he balances out Sir Admiral Major Kled's Yosemite Sam sharp-toothed level of violence with dumb lizard cuteness. The two of them make a perfect Looney Tunes comedy duo, at once opposites and complementary, and it is impossible not to be cheered up at least a little bit by their antics. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Kakma is the most adorable little void puppy and also he eats people. When Malsahar was driven mad by a summoning voice from the void, that summoning beacon anchored itself in his mind and kept calling. Kakma is one creature that feels that call and he now ambles his way across Rune Terra, always heading for Malsahar while consuming anything and everything in his way. What happens when Kakma finds Malsahar, we don't know, but to be honest, I also doubt that Riot is ever going to show us. As a design, Kakma reflects his time, that time being 2010. The aesthetics of the void were not at all settled then, so Kakma looks like a halfway mix between a caterpillar and a sergling. He's a stubby little insectoid mouth on legs, with head tentacles and rather random spikes everywhere, and none of the purple tones usually associated with void creatures. On the upside, he is rather adorable and one of the very few void entities whose behavior is coded less malicious and more naive and innocent and only massively destructive on accident. He badly needs a rework in my opinion, but he's also one of those champions who people would create protest petitions on change.org if Riot changed his design too much, so his upcoming texture update is probably about the best we can hope for. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. LeBlanc looks completely ridiculous, but once upon a time that was probably the point. In the lore, she's the enigmatic cult leader of the Black Rose, basically the Noxus Illuminati, forever working towards nebulously nefarious ends and seeking to hold the reins of power in Noxus. In truth, she's an ancient sorceress who assisted in the defeat of the warlord Mordekaiser and who now holds a vigil over his remains at Noxus to forestall his probably inevitable return. And since Mordekaiser is an existential threat to every living thing on Runeterra, to LeBlanc all measures are justified to oppose him. Murder, slavery, and child abuse are just a few of the ones we know of. As a design, LeBlanc is, as I said, ridiculous, wearing some kind of ostentatious spider with bathing suit under a cloak and decked out in a gold, black, and bright pink color scheme that hurts the eyes to even think about. But that was once the point. She's an illusionist, and so she dresses like a stage magician, and she operated openly in the League of Legends in the old days as a fighter. In the modern lore, she stays in the shadows, and so her Legends of Rune Terror design scales her back to more of a fantasy mafia matriarch vibe, which works a lot better, I think. But in League of Legends proper, we get to enjoy one of the truly worst outfits in the entire game for at least a little while longer. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Lee Sin is an odd one. Once upon a time, he was a summoner in training to join the League of Legends, whose arrogance led to the destruction of an innocent village. He retired in shame and became a monk instead, and he then self-immolated in protest of the Noxian invasion of Ionia in an ill-advised direct reference to actual real-life political protests against religious persecution in South Vietnam in the 60s. Woof. Anyway, in the modern lore, he's still a monk struggling with ego who pursued the power of a dragon spirit and was blinded for his hubris. Now he practices humility and control and pursues the perfection of his craft, and he's also good friends with Udyr. As a design, he is designed to embody an archetype not to challenge it, and so he's just about every cultural trope about kung fu monks rolled into one character, complete with mystical tattoos and magic dragon spirit power. He's one of the very few visibly disabled characters in League of Legends, which is nice, albeit his disability never actually really comes up as a storytelling element, so your mileage may vary on that one. He's a consistently popular character in the game because kung fu monks are cool, but it's hard to say anything interesting about him that isn't painfully evident at a simple glance. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Leona is a religious zealot dedicated to the supremacy of her faith imbued with divine powers and hampered only by a massive tragic lesbian love bond with her polar opposite. As you may recall, Leona and Diana were always meant to be lovers, if not for the interference of Riot's management, and where Diana is the outcast rejected by society for standing by her differentness, Leona is the steadfast assimilationist, comfortable in the bosom of orthodoxy. Leona wants Diana to find peace in the Solari faith, Diana wants Leona to question dogma and seek truth. This disagreement, once charged up on divine god spirit power, explodes into tragic and pointless violence. They are two people who desperately 
need each other kept apart by the bigotries and the societies that they are a part of. As a design, Leona is not great, something which even her original designer, Iron Stylus, has been pretty upfront about. She's meant to be this unbreakable bulwark of faith battle tank, but her actual armor consists of a metal bikini top and skirt and some kind of bizarre bodysuit. Her arms are stick thin and she runs around in ultra spiky stiletto heels for some reason. Her wild rift design improves on some of this and incorporates some silver accents as a reference to the sun moon duality and her bond with Diana, but I think my girl here needs a rework and a proper set of plate armor. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Lilia is a timid little fey fawn who wanders the world, tending to the dreams of mortals like a gardener. She was born when a spiritual dream tree made to absorb and spread the wonder of mortals' dreams had a dream of its own. That dream turned into a flower bud, and that flower bud became Lilia. Don't ask me to explain how any of that works, it's magic. The invasions of Noxus and the psychic trauma that it creates in Ionia's collective psyche eventually infects the realm of dreams as well, becoming a sickness that threatens to kill Lilia's mother tree. To save her parents, she ventures into the world to heal the dreams of mortals, armed with nothing but her sleep magic and a stick from the dream tree, forever adorably timid, tripping over her own legs and shyness. As a design, Lilia is intensely adorable. Big Disney Prince's eyes, long, floppy ears, and animated with the springiest adorable cartoon doe aesthetics imaginable. Her appeal comes from her cutesy shyness, which is sold especially through the animation. I do wish they'd go further in making her look flower-like. Some of it is there in her hair resembling petals, but her weird leaf bikini could be pushed a lot further in selling the look, I think. She's yet another cute girl in the game full of them, but damn if she isn't one of the cutest. Now, if only I could stop wondering how a centaur born from a flower can have a belly button. My grade is Happy Leona emote. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Lysandra, Cerilda, and Avarosa are legendary figures in the Frail Yord, unifiers, saviors, conquerors, and sisters. Losing her eyesight in the battle with the Volibear, Lysandra wanders in dreams instead and comes into contact with the awful intelligences of the Void. They offer her power in exchange for preparing Rune Terra for their coming. She takes the bargain, but her sisters are less than pleased with simply accepting the apocalypse and opt to fight back instead. And in a fateful moment, Lysandra sacrifices her sisters and all she has ever known to seal the Void Beasts in the Howling Abyss, but their Tomb of Ice cannot hold forever, and now Lysandra stalls desperately for time, holding back the end for as long as possible before she has to become its herald. As a design, Lysandra is a gorgeous Ice Witch. Statuesque, inscrutable, and imposing, her eyeless helmet and dark visage drips with the promise of dark secrets. The long lines that rise up her form and the neck of her helmet make her taller, the black ice she travels on gives her a menacing air of inevitability, and she looks about as much like an ageless dark sorceress as you could ask for, marred only by a weird decision to also give her cleavage like she wasn't hot already. My grade is Lady Dimitrescu from Resident Evil. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Before Viego, Lucian was the ultimate wife guy of League of Legends. As members of the Light Sentinels, an order of warriors dedicated to battling the undead, Lucian and his wife Senna were ensnared by Thresh who imprisoned Senna's soul in his lantern and used it to bait Lucian into ever more torturous, obsessive battles to free her. With the power of sheer wife respecting, however, Lucian finally manages to put a crack in Thresh's lantern, freeing Senna to walk the world as a semi-undead ghostbuster at his side once more. He struggles still to deal with the trauma of losing her and has become somewhat overprotective as the two of them resume their duties as Sentinels. Personally, I can't wait for the visual novel where they go to much-needed couples therapy. As a design, Lucian is slick, sleek, and in some ways rather modern in his expression. His outfit looks like it takes some inspiration from high fashion. His twin coattails, long hood, and dreads give him a sharp arrow-like profile, and his white, black, and gold high-contrast color scheme is a little basic, but ultimately memorable. He teeters right on the edge of being over-designed, with crisscrossing lines and decorations on his pauldrons without ever actually going over. My grade is man and woman, skull light bulb, fishhook anger love emoji. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Gwen is a doll created by Isolde, wife of Viego the Ruined King, when Isolde was a child. Like a beloved teddy bear, she was Isolde's favorite companion until it came time to put away childish things and get married. When Viego's obsessive attempts to revive Isolde from death results in a cataclysmic ruination, a piece of Isolde's soul finds its way back to its childhood toy and turns the puppet into a real girl. Now, Gwen uses her life and odd powers to fight back Viego's black mist, hoping to protect the world from his revenant obsession. As a design, Gwen is a victim of context. She's yet one more conventionally pretty girl added to a game that's full of them already, which sparked a lot of disappointment, including for me when her doll brought to life concept seemed so perfect for a creepy or horror-themed champion idea instead. Looking at the design in his own terms, though, it's fine. Gwen is essentially Isolde's childhood original character, Do Not Steal, a cheerful pretty princess with fantastic hair and a gorgeous dress, adventuring in the world using magic scissors as a cool weapon. Anyone who's ever made an anime fan character should be able to relate to the idea and why it might be fun. She's cute and inoffensive, and while yeah, I would have been more interested in something else, taken on her own terms, she's fine. My grade is Knife 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 Viego. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Did you know that once upon a time Lulu was a yordle led astray by fairies who stayed in their realm so long that when she came back everyone she knew was dead? Yeah, they retconned that bit. Nowadays, Lulu is the literal manic pixie dreamer girl of the yordles, a mix of non sequiturs and lol so random humor with good old fashioned Looney Tunes physical gags. Yordles are a sort of fairy creatures already, but her companion, Pix, guided her to a place called the Glade, which basically turns the dreamlike weirdness of the non material realms up to 11 and then some, which supercharged Lulu's own magical powers in turn. She's apparently friends with Zoe, which makes sense, and often acts as the wacky goofball foil to Tristana's attempts at seriousness, which 
which is adorable. As a design, Lulu is a hat. A hat with a giant weird face underneath it, arms that are way too long, and a robe that mostly exists to conceal the complete anatomical incoherence of her body. This is because she's an old character that desperately needs an update, and thankfully she looks a lot better in her appearances outside the main game. The giant hat, purple skin, and crooked staff fits her face source for a stick okay, albeit I wish they'd make her a bit more visibly goofy and weird. My grade is a smaller version of this short where I sound like a chipmunk. Do you know that once upon a time Lulu was yordled and destroyed by fairies who stayed in their realm so long that when she came back everyone she knew was dead? Yeah, they retconned that bit. Lux is the sister of Garen, scion of the noble Krongard family of Demacia, which is charged with keeping order in no small part by persecuting mages. She is also a mage, a fact which is well known in her family, but which they've kept hidden for decades, once even attempting to cure Lux's condition with a painful and dangerous treatment, trying to convert her through therapy in case you missed the obvious queer metaphors of magic in Demacia. Lux is central to the current mage rebellion, arguably partly responsible for Silas's escape, and a source of enormous emotional conflict for Garen's loyalties. Last we saw her, she was confronting Silas and the Freljord along with Garen, but it's not really clear what her status is with the Demacian state currently. Lux is powerful enough that her magic can awaken and summon Galio all on her own, which is a substantial feat, and she has an odd friendship with the Colossus going back to her childhood. As a design, Lux is a bit of a mess. She's not a soldier, but she wears armor, and that armor is not elaborate or decorative enough to read as ceremonial or as a uniform, but it's also not remotely practical enough to actually be protective. Pair that with a featureless black bodysuit, and I'm ready to say that even though she looks better in Legends of Runeterra, my girl still needs a makeover that expresses some actual personality. My grade is Elsa from Frozen before she sings Let It Go. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Malphite is one of those old characters whose design was justified by he came from another dimension so we don't have to explain it. For most of his history, his lore and personality were complete voids, and consequently, despite being in the game since 2009, Malphite has literally only ever had one story told about him in the lore. It's pretty good, though. Recently, Riot began a process of giving him a full retcon and makeover, and now he's a shard of a living rock that has grown to mountain size. He was once part of a grand floating fortress that was crafted by a sorcerer trying to battle back the void, and when that fortress was sundered, the shard that would be Malphite buried into the earth and gathered strength for centuries, still intent on its mission of driving back the consuming void that threatens the world. As a design, Malphite is a rock golem, and most of all looks like a semi-powerful World of Warcraft mob, or a tokusatsu kaiju actor in a rubber suit getting ready to fight Godzilla. His updated looks in Wild Rift and Legends of Runeterra are better, but not more interesting. I'm really missing a sense of him as a wildly overgrown shard of a man-made construct rather than a basic rock elemental, which is something that the channel subjectively included brilliantly in their fan rework of the character, link in the description. My grade is a Google image search for the words rock golem. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Malzahar is the only idiot on Runeterra, both nihilistic and dumb enough to be a willing prophet for the Void, having decided that the only solution to bad things happening is to make all things stop happening forever, and if billions have to die to make it so, then so be it. To be fair, he's had kind of a miserable life. Born with powers of divination, he lost his parents early on and lived in the gutter for most of his life, eventually carving out a wealthy business telling fortunes, but never actually dealing with his trauma. Realizing that money can't buy happiness, he starts wandering the desert instead, eventually making his way to Akathia, where pulsing Void portals emit a haunting call that his messed up mind is amenable to. He sees in the Void an end to all suffering, confuses that for wisdom, and becomes imbued with Void powers which he uses to start a doomsday cult and actively hastens the spread of the Void across Shirima. What a dumbass. As a design, Malzahar is a bit of a non-entity. He draws some inspiration from classic Jin imagery, but it doesn't do much for him since he isn't that. He's mostly just covered up in fat breaks wearing weird gauntlets and carries around a dagger, which he doesn't use for anything. The one really cool detail about him is the hole in his hood and his head, revealing a bunch of spiraling Void nonsense where his brain should be. And I'll admit, that is pretty good storytelling about the character. My grade is Thanos doing a handshake with a Doomer. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Maokai is yet another victim of Yego's hubris. Once a peaceful tree ant who drank deep of the life-giving waters of the Blessed Isles and spent his days landing saplings and doing harmony with nature stuff, he was horribly twisted when Diego's ruination destroyed the Isles, barely holding onto life by carrying a last reservoir of life water inside him. He stayed on the Shadow Isles, relentlessly battling the wraiths and black mists, trying to take back any little patch of soil where life might begin to grow again. Very occasionally, a flower or little sapling gets to grow in those cursed lands under his protection. Maokai is a pretty decent character design overall. He avoids the usual stereotypes associated with tree ants, looking more like a gnarled, hoary tree stump brought to life by spite and vinegar than a wise old tree beard or nymphy dryad. He's highly asymmetrical and visually unbalanced, giving him a monstrous appearance in his proportions, and the two faces on his body add to the overall haunted, ghostly aesthetic really well. The only weird thing is he's wearing a loincloth for some reason, right? You're not telling us that Maokai has a, uh, I mean, there isn't anything to cover up there, right? Riot, answer me! My greatest tree and flower thumbs up emoji and an incomprehensible black metal band logo. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Master Yi is a solemn swordsman, last of his line and the final master of his martial arts school, who honors the memory of his ancestors by looking like a character from a 90s toy cartoon with a title like Ultra Sword Samurai Supermasters. Master Yi, like almost all Ionian champions, has a story that revolves around the conflict with Noxus. In his case, his village of Wuju was the origin of a secretive and incredibly powerful school of swordsmanship. When Yi decided to go fight back the Noxian invasion, Noxus High Command decided that letting a village of secret super samurai live was a bad idea and had singed chemically firebomb all life out of the place. Destroyed by the trauma, Yi spends years in self-imposed isolation until Wukong shows up and refuses to leave 
leave until Yi makes him his pupil. And through this connection, Yi begins to refine himself and pass on his knowledge. Again, though, Master Yi looks like a 90s toy and it makes it incredibly hard to take his story seriously. Acid green swords and yellow accents over elaborate plate armor and a frickin' splinter cell night vision helmet just doesn't say veteran martial arts master struggling with war trauma, it says batteries sold separately. Recent art shows him in a more sober and believable aesthetic, but in game, to be honest, he just looks silly. My grade is monkey fencer family emojis. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Misfortune's gonna need two videos, because there's two misfortunes in League of Legends. The first is the lady that you see here, Sarah Fortune, busty redhead pirate, bounty hunter, hardy extraordinaire. This version of Misfortune is a horny pirate maiden sex fantasy on legs, and she was written as such. Misfortune spills into the great hallway with the same tenacity that she spills into her silk blouse, both taxed to contain her. She bounds across the tiles, the impact of every footfall ripples up the curves of her figure, the distraction of her beauty magnified in motion. This is how she used to be described in canon lore. And her character design, well, fits that. She's a skinny and slender, yet enormously stacked redhead with perfect makeup up, a cutesy oversized pirate hat from a Halloween costume, enormous cartoon handguns, and pants ripped open along the sides so we get some thigh action as well. And if she was unique in being a horny sex pot character, that might be okay, the game could have room for that, but when every third woman in the game is a hot lady with a tragic backstory, something as cartoonishly overwrought as this version of Misfortune feels less like sexy fun and more like cringy self-parody. My grade is this 1940s Tex Avery cartoon clip. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. There are two misfortunes in League of Legends. See part one for the first one, this is a video about the second one. This is Sarah Fortune. As a child, she saw a young gangplank murder her parents and nearly kill her, and she swore a terrible revenge. She took up bounty hunting and built up a network of loyal contacts, which finally helped her overthrow gangplank, publicly executing him by blowing his ship to kingdom come. He survived, obviously. Now, she struggles with the power politics of Bilgewater, trying to keep it from falling into civil war after the death of its pirate king, and every day she fears she feels herself become more like the brutal pirate lord she overthrew. Captain Fortune is who Miss Fortune is actually in the lore, and she's the character who appears in the upcoming Ruined King game. She has maybe more lore than any other character in League of Legends, and much of it is actually really good. Her design keeps her sexy and a redhead, high heels and corsets and pirates aesthetics, but has matured away from staring at her breasts all the time, and frames her instead as a cool feminine action hero, which doesn't make her super unique, but it's well executed and fun. Her League character model is still clearly meant to be a sexy blow-up doll no matter how you skin it, but outside of that, my grade is Lara Croft John Wick lipstick kiss. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Hey, can I copy your homework? Okay, just make sure to change it a little. Mordekaiser is almost refreshing in his simplicity. He's an evil warlord who wants to murder everybody because he is an evil warlord. In life, he conquered worlds, and when he died, he found the afterlife empty of the eternal glory he thought he had earned by, you know, doing all that murder all the time. Being a petty little piss boy about it, he gets himself necromantically revived as a suit of armor to conquer the world once more, and he uses the souls of those he kills to forge a realm of death for himself. He is temporarily banished, partly due to his betrayal by LeBlanc, but he has a way back to Rune Terra, which lies at the heart of Noxus, and time is ticking on when he's gonna use it. Mordekaiser is League of Legends Sauron. He's the Lich King, he's the Overlord, he is the obligatory ominous fantasy armor tyrant final boss bad guy. He is, in other words, created to embody an archetype and not to challenge it, and in that he does perhaps too good of a job. He's exactly what it says on the tin, and while there's no interesting innovation here, sometimes you can make the argument that a classic is a classic because it works. My grade is a pile of metal and a pile of metal. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Morgana is the twin sister of Kale and the dark one of their twins but opposite yin yang dynamic. The twist of these twins is that Kale is an unfeeling tyrannical despot who will rain murderous justice on anyone who questions her, while dark Morgana embodies the idea of compassionate justice, where you know reform, restitution, and nuance is possible, and fatalistic punishment isn't the only option. They are both of them children of the Targonian aspect of justice and a human man, and where Kale is obsessively pursuing her divine heritage, Morgana rejects it and binds her wings to come closer to humanity. She lives hiding in the shadows in Demacia and offers help and support to those who need it, although we've never actually seen any of that come to fruition in the actual lore. As a design, Morgana is big titty goth girlfriend, and while her more hedonistic, sumptuous evening gown does offer some contrast with Kale's armored angel vibe, for both sisters, the contrast and opposite differences between them could have been pushed so much harder and been so much more interesting. There's a great dynamic here, and all the right ideas are present, but the trip over Riot's bizarre commitment to remaking the same three fantasy babes over and over again in different costumes regardless of the context. My grade is a half-decent reheated microwave lasagna. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Don't ask me why a fish person has mammaries, I don't know, just roll with it. Nami is one of the Mariah, tribe of seaborn Vestaya, that's animal-human hybrid people in Runeterra, furries basically, who has taken up the staff and duty of the Tide Caller to complete an important ritual to safeguard her people's future. Nami needs a moonstone, a magic rock that protects her people from void-spawned monsters in the deep sea, and only the aspect of the moon, that's Diana, can create such a thing. Unfortunately, Diana is a bit busy with the whole Solari Lunaris civil war and isn't around to make it, so Nami has decided to go find her wherever she may hide. Nami is the only merperson champion in League of Legends, and is very much your classic created-to-embody-an-archetype-not-to-challenge-it situation. She's a 
gorgeous mermaid person with a long tail, sparkly scales, and prominent uh, fins. Besides the dark hip armor and the helmet she wears, there's really very little else to her in terms of culture and fashion. And her staff and all its bright, saturated colors seems to be of another aesthetic entirely than the rest of her gear. It all adds up to a pretty vague design overall, with almost no sense of the culture that she's supposed to represent as the tide caller. Not a bad design, mine just vague. My grade is a fish, a cookie cutter, and a direct-to-video Little Mermaid sequel. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ah, Nasus, first of the furries of League of Legends. Nasus is a champion of Shirima, curator of its vast underground libraries. As a child, he was sickly but brilliant and was offered ascension in a last-ditch effort to save his life. His brother Renekton carried him into the raging storm of ascension magic, and they were remade together as brother god warriors. He had to imprison Renekton under the desert after the fall of his ear to contain Xerath, and after that he wandered the desert depressed and deteriorating for centuries, haunted by his brother's ghosts. Now he has retaken his position as advisor to Azir's emerging empire, but he's still haunted by the past he left behind, fearful of Xerath's plans, and certain for his wayward brother with whom he's desperate to reconcile. As a design, Nasus is Anubis. He's Anubis directly copied from Egyptian mythology, and as with Sobig and Ra slash Horus before him, Riot has never been shy about that particular influence. He's an upright dog furry with some pharaoh-ish headgear, a bunch of gold on him, and mummy bandages because he's <laughs> all Egyptian. And while I do wish Riot had done something to make him more distinctly unique to the League of Legends universe, still, my grade is absolutely do not Google him without safe search on. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Nautilus was once a salvage diver, scavenging treasure from wrecked ships, who always threw a coin to the bearded lady's tithe for safe passage over the waves. But then the treasure started to dry up, and in desperation he let an unscrupulous captain who refused to pay the tithe put him in a giant diving suit to dive too greedily and far too deep. Something took Nautilus there in the deep, and when he awoke after a hundred years of unnatural slumber, he found that the armored suit was his body now. With most of his memories lost, all he remembered was the captain who refused to pay the tithe, and the titan of the depths swore revenge on him and everyone else who refuses to pay what the sea is owed. Now, in Bilgewater, if your captain does not pay the tithe, the anchor of Nautilus will come for him. Everyone pays the tithe. As a design, though, Nautilus is a lot more goofy than intimidating. He's old, and with that age comes a cartoonish, big-headed aesthetic that doesn't really serve his story, making him look more like a Scooby-Doo villain than a sailor's nightmare. His concept is very cool, and the design is like 70% of the way there, but still, my grade is a balloon animal and a can of tuna. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Nika is one of the last surviving Uvi Cat, a tribe of particularly spiritually attuned Vestaya who can change her shape as easily as others change their expressions. When her tribe's home was devastated by some unspecified disaster, Nico fled to survive and ended up in the jungles of Ishtal, where she runs with Nidalee, developing an unreciprocated romantic crush, making her the first queer champion in the game after only nine years and 140 other champions. Leaving Nidalee's pack, Nico develops an ambition of rebuilding her tribe with whoever can be persuaded to share her dream, and she roams the world looking for people who will match her spirit, trying to quell the nightmares that haunt her of her old home's destruction. Being a shapeshifter based on a chameleon, it sure is a fun coincidence that 99% of the time Nico just happens to take the shape of a conventionally attractive cute humanoid girl with a bit of green skin and a lizard tail. She's obviously designed for appeal, which works well enough with her story, but I still find it disappointing that nothing more interesting was done with the premise of an enthusiastic chameleon person for whom shapeshifting is literally part of her language. My grade is lizard kitty pride flag and a smiley, cause she is cute. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Oh boy, Nidalee, there's a can of worms. She's a feral kid, abandoned or lost in the jungle as a child, and for some reason taken in by a pride of cougars who raise her as their own. Over time, Nidalee becomes able to shapeshift, flickering from human to cougar form, and she finds herself haunted by vague and hazy memories of people who might be her parents. When her cougar mother is killed by hunters, she takes up leadership of the pride and even takes in Nico for a while while the chameleon girl is searching for a new family. As a design, Nidalee is... A stripper. Like, she literally pole dances, it is extremely not subtle. She wears a sexy Halloween jungle woman costume, complete with random bone ornaments, tiny loincloth, enormous cleavage, and for some reason, leg warmers. She also has a perfect face of flawless makeup, because of course she does. The savage sexy jungle woman trope has a troubling, problematic, and extensively documented history in colonialist and racist propaganda, and it's honestly just toe-curlingly cringeworthy to see it reproduced so uncritically in the game. Riot has produced substantially better art of Nidalee, but until that art is actually reflected in the game, I'm gonna bring back the letter grades for just one video so I can give this an F. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Nocturne, aka why is he even still in the game after the Fiddlesticks rework? Theoretically, Nocturne is a demon feeding on the fears of mortals. Again, kinda redundant next to Fiddlesticks, but he's a nightmare demon specifically, haunting the realms of sleep, who occasionally manifests in the physical realm. He's connected to, and was perhaps created by, shadow magic, which is the same sort of power that Zed manipulates to make his shadows, but that connection has never really been explored in lore. His most prominent role in an actual story was as antagonist to Garen Lux in a very decent short story called Fortimacia. I recommend it, look it up. But beyond that, he's a bit of a non 
entity. And also, his design kind of sucks. Like a lot of old champions, Nocturne just looks like a lesser World of Warcraft mob. A dark, floaty shadow man with inexplicable giant spiky pauldrons and cartoonishly spiky wrist blades. He's not a liquid, formless nightmare infecting your psyche and preying on the darkest corners of your mind. He's the cover art on the album of your cousin's shitty garage metal band. My grade is snore, 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 sleep emoji. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Nunu is a young Freljord boy who is separated from his loving mother and tribe by the Frost Guard, apparently because Lysandra thinks his tribe knows secrets about the past that she wants. Escaping, he comes upon Willem, a lone surviving Yeti who has grown feral in the long years of solitude, guarding a powerful magical crystal of dreams. The purity and kindness of Nunu's heart gentles the Yeti and gives him back his soul, and in that moment, Willem knows that Nunu will save the Freljord. He infuses Nunu with the crystal's power and resolves to travel with him as a friend and protector. I think Nunu and Willem are one of the best designs in the game, frankly. Not only are they incredibly adorable, but the fundamental childish fantasy of going on adventures with your big cool imagination imaginary monster friend is a timeless classic to draw on, and due to my own personal biases, it hits me like a truck. I defy you to look at the Nunu and Willem death animation without feeling pain in your chest. And while Willem is a full-on My Neighbor Totoro adorable fluff monster, the six arms, sharp teeth, and prominent claws keep just enough of a sense of animal danger to hint at the darker realities that Nunu can't see in his childish naivete. My grade, and I do not say this lightly, is Calvin and Hobbes. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Say hello to Chip, the best character design in all of Terra. He's my perfect pebble child, I've put him in all of my decks, and if anything ever kills him, I immediately surrender because I failed as a human being. On the surface, there really isn't any question why Chip works. He's a cute little four-legged rock turtle with big eyes and a broad face, but while, yeah, that's cute, that's not really what gives him an edge over the dragon child. Chip works because of his voiceover and card narration. In his interactions, he's an excitable child, bantering with his fellow rock elementals and playing around with Talia. And in the card flavor text, he's offering an adorable walking tour of Targon to the mountain sojourners. And it threads a careful line because there's a hard limit on how much adorable baby talk I'm willing to tolerate, but Chip manages to convey the feeling that he's talking like that because he's a tiny over-enthusiastic kid who can't enunciate, which makes it charming rather than annoying, although your mileage may vary. There's few things in the world more charming than sincerity, and that's what Chip has in spades. I do wish his guardian on the board would sound like he does in the cards, though, because right now what we're getting is weird grunts and snorts that don't really sound like the character at all. My grade is if anything were to happen to him, I'll kill everyone in this room and then myself meme. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Created to embody an archetype and not to challenge it. I could end this video right here, but let's dig a little deeper. Olaf is an iceborne from a particularly warlike part of the Freljord, who heard a prophecy that he will die peacefully. Because he is every Viking stereotype, this upsets him. He wants a warrior's death in battle, and so he goes out to find one and fails. Every legendary monster he fights dies. Every warbrand he challenges falls. Every death-defying stunt succeeds. Eventually, he challenges Sejuani, who manages to fight him to a standstill and promises him that she will find him a glorious death in battle if he promises to die in service to the Winter's Claw, which he accepts. Anyway, as a design, Olaf off is every pop culture Viking stereotype rolled into one, there's barely a point to describing him because it's just so obvious. The one thing I'm missing from him is battle scars. I feel like his constant failure to die is funnier and more frustrating if he has obviously been so close to death a million times and yet keeps surviving by the skin of his teeth, but yeah. My grade is me doing an extended rant on all the ways Olaf design perpetuates historically inaccurate stereotypes about my people's history. Like, first of all, that helmet. Nobody wore a helmet with horns on. Why would Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Oriana was once a human woman, poisoned by the toxins of Zaun when she tried to help the victims of a chemical disaster. Her father, a brilliant Hextech engineer, replaced her poisoned limbs and organs with Hextech prosthetics until the poison left her with only her heart intact. And then the tables turned because Oriana's father developed a heart condition, and with somewhat mechanical logic, Oriana gave him hers, and replaced her own heart with a Hextech crystal contained in a floating orb. Now she wanders the world, searching for a place to fit in, trying to reconcile her mechanical heart with her human soul. As a design, Oriana is probably a lot creepier than she needs to be, with especially her animation leaning into uncanny valley territory. And this is because she used to be written much more as a creepy murder doll rather than a tragic reverse Pinocchio. Still, there's a timeless classiness to her ornamented clockwork ballerina aesthetic, and I do love any design that plays with uncanny anatomy and breaking the human form unnaturally. I guess the one thing I'd say is that I feel like her orb is weirdly primitive and doesn't really play with the elaborate ballerina motif that she's got going overall. My grade is an artificial bird that sparkles like diamonds and sings only waltzes. Bonus points if you get the reference. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Orn is a Freljord demigod, brother of Volibear, and a somewhat natural opposite to Volibear's raw survivalism, anger, and murder primitivism. He's a god of the forge, one of the creators of the Freljord, an introverted craftsman who cares deeply for his work, and a grumpy old fatherly caretaker whose gruff demeanor hides a deep well of emotion. Orn once had a thriving community of followers, the Hearthblood, with whom he shared his passion for craftsmanship. They died in a cataclysmic confrontation between Orn and Volibear, and he has never really gotten over the loss. With the old gods of the Freljord stirring to action, particularly his brother, Orn too is exiting his isolation. He crafted the bridges of the Howling Abyss, 
after all, and presumably will play a part in battling the void horrors that are buried there. As a design, Orn is essentially a box on legs, sturdy, squat, grounded, and eminently understated, with his elaborate horns the only bit of real decoration to his look. With his sensible blacksmith's apron, hammer, close-cropped beard, and tool belt, he's the very image of the dependable dad, the patron saint of Home Depot, the avatar of wearing socks with sandals, and possibly the best hugger on all of Runeterra. My grade is a deck, a set of power tools, and a barbecue pit. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Pantheon is a misotheist. He believes in the gods, but specifically he believes that they are assholes. Once immortal named Atreus, who as a warrior was mostly good at getting up after a beating, he ascended Mount Targon and was possessed by the aspect of war, Pantheon, who essentially took his body on a joyride to go hunting Darkin on Runeterra. This turned out poorly for Pantheon when Aatrox lured him into a bad fight and stabbed him through the chest. Pantheon died, Atreus survived, and cursed the gods and Darkin both for treating human lives like toys in their petty games. Now he walks Runeterra using Pantheon's old weapons by sheer force of mortal will, battling back the abuses of Ascended and aspects alike, and trying to make a place for humanity among the divine. As a design, Pantheon is man candy, designed very explicitly to be sexually appealing to, well, to people who are into his particular kind of muscle, hairy masculinity, fully leaning into the mythologized naked but for loincloth ancient Greek hero aesthetic with a visible scar across his chest and shield emphasizing the mortal vulnerability that forms the core of his story themes. I'm not sure his sexualization is necessary, but it is unique and therefore I think a good addition. My grade is 100,000 League of Legends fans all experiencing the this better not awaken anything in me meme simultaneously. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Poppy is a humble yordle who helped found an entire nation and who is almost certainly a legendary hero meant to protect that nation from devastation. Being uncomfortable in the magical whimsy of Bandle City, Poppy was drawn to the militaristic discipline of fledging Demacia instead and fell in with a legendary hero of the city's founding, Orlon, who eventually passed his equally legendary hammer onto her, telling her they was meant to go to a true hero of Demacia. When he died, she swore to find this hero and put the hammer in their hands. For centuries, she has traveled and protected Demacia with that hammer, eternally too humble to even consider that the hero could be her. As a design, Poppy is kind of wonderfully practical. She wears a gorget over padded leather armor with thick gloves and sensible boots, her colors are earth-toned and muted, and it's really only her oversized hammer, bringing any sense of fantasy whimsy to her visuals. This ties in really well with her humble nature. She would never see herself as a larger-than-life fantasy hero, and so she doesn't dress like one. She's a down-to-earth and practical everyman, literally carrying around a grand fantasy destiny much larger than herself. My grade is two boots, a nail, and Excalibur. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Pike is a ghost of sorts, or a revenant. Once a highly skilled harpoon fisherman diving into the mouths of sea monsters to butcher them alive, his lifeline was cut by a cowardly captain and an enormous jaw fish took him to the deep. Once there, though, something brought him back, stoking his thirst for revenge and imbuing him with the power to take it. Now he stalks Bilgewater with a list of the crew from his old ship in one hand and a skewer in the other, crossing off the names of those who betrayed him. But curiously, no matter how many he kills, there always seems to be at least one more name on the list, and in his swimming mind, another betrayer's face always fades into view, compelling him to butcher again. As a design, Pike is a little bit on the literal side, with a shoulder pieces literally being fish teeth snapping shut around him and his bloodied bandana depicting the same, but that is a good design aesthetic for a revenant obsessively reliving the moment of its betrayal. Pike is festooned with hooks and knives, but other than that his outfit is fairly practical and workmanlike and a bit understated in color, which again showcases the character's history as a workman really well. My grade is that to-do list app that you downloaded when you were trying to get yourself organized, made two lists in it, forgot about it, rediscovered it six months later and made another list that you then promptly forgot about. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Kiana is the youngest of ten sisters in a noble ruling family of Ishtal. To the surprise of no one, she has something to prove, and being blessed with a once-in-a-generation overwhelming talent for elemental magic, she is out to prove it. She fights against the bonds of tradition, resentful of her last place in the order of succession, and burns with youthful ambition and hunger for respect that eventually drives her to attack miners and explorers from Piltover who are encroaching on Ishtal as a way to prove her power. Now, she rides a wave of defensive xenophobia that rallies support behind her even as she plans to overthrow the order of Ishtal itself and claim a place as empress. As a design, Kiana is understated. Given that her whole thing is hunger for recognition, respect, and power and that she sees herself as a natural empress who deserves all the accolades of power, her aesthetic feels a bit uncharacteristically humble. With a dress, leggings, a few bracelets, and fantasy flip-flops, it's only really her immaculately styled hair and jeweled tiara that stands out as ostentatious. She's not a bad design, but I think she could lean harder into her self-aggrandizing and burning need for recognition in her visuals. And I do wish that League of Legends wasn't already so oversaturated with confident hot action girls making Kiana less special by comparison. My grade is a candle burning at both ends. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Quinn is a ranger knight of Demacia, forever scouting the frontier for enemy activity with her Parker Bird Valor. As a child, she was closely bonded with her twin brother Caleb, who died in a tragic hunting accident. Years later, destroyed by the grief, Quinn is nearly killed by the same beast that murdered her brother, if not for the intervention of a great Asherite eagle, that's Valor, who saves her. There's some vague implication that Valor might be her twin brother reincarnated somehow, but it's not explored in the lore. Anyway, bonding with Valor, she becomes a famous ranger knight of Demacia and does scout stuff for the army. Quinn is another wonderfully practical design, wearing sensible thick leather armor with lots of well-crafted bird motifs weaving through her gear. Her cape looks like feathers, her quiver and crossbow has 
wing designs, her helmet has a beak, her boots have talons, heck, even her hip armor is styled to look like folded wings. She looks credibly like someone who spends their days traveling through the rough wilderness, and the elaborate bird styling on her gear makes it clear that she's no ordinary traveler. If anything, she's kind of a victim of her own success. She looks so grounded and so composed that in the game as colorful and over the top as League of Legends, she can easily come across as kind of boring. Still, I think she's a great example of well-crafted character design and might as a bird, a neutral face, and a just right. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ramis is... Okay. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for... Ramis is kind of unique in League of Legends. His legendarily limited voice acting and simplistic design has given him meme status in the game's community, and his lore leans into this. He is essentially a sort of meme in Shirima as well, with so much folklore and so many stories swirling around him that he's culturally elevated to a sort of legendary status far beyond what is probably actually justified by his nature. As a design, he is... Well, he's a spike ball turtle on legs. His simplicity kind of defies description because, like, yeah, he's an armadillo creature with spikes on it who rolls around, like you would expect an armadillo creature with spikes on it to, you know, do. There really isn't much you can say about Ramus, either as analysis or criticism, except that he's triple S tier, the best character design in the entire game, and you can't change my mind. Bye! Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Rek'Sai is a void creature, which means that at some point she crossed from the void into Runeterra, and now she spends her time finding ways to eat the world, or, in her case, eat whatever hapless soul is unlucky enough to encounter her and her brood in the deserts of Shirima. Outside of that, she has no lore or discernible personality. She's about as classic of a monster creature as you get, and mostly exists to act as an antagonistic force in other people's stories. Not that Riot has ever actually bothered to use her that way, but a boy can dream. Like many monsters, she's a chimera mishmash of animal influences. She has obvious insectoid features with her segmented body, and her ability to birth a swarm of broodlings takes after ants, bees, or termites. On on top of which, she swims to the ground like a shark, complete with an ominous fin above the ground. Her biggest problem is that it's really hard to describe her in terms that aren't derivative. There's a clear depth to the Zerg in her aesthetic, and to a lesser extent, H.R. Giger's xenomorphs, the Warhammer 40 Tyranids, and by extension, the bugs of Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers. There's very little that makes her stand out as her own unique monster, and when being a cool monster is literally all she has, this is kind of a blow against her. Riot could have gone a lot harder to make her special, I think. My grade is the Zerg, the Xenomorph, the Tyranids, and the bugs. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in depth videos. Rel is a child soldier, raised by LeBlanc's Black Rose to be groomed as a weapon against Mordekaiser. She was born into a fallen aristocratic family and blessed with the unique ability to magically manipulate metal, for which the Black Rose removed her away to a secluded school, where they improved her powers by pitting her in combat against other gifted children. When Rel beat them, she would be infused with their powers through a painful process of magical branding. When she was 16, she finally grew strong and independent enough to rebel, and found to her horror that the Black Rose had installed her own mother to oversee her torture, with promises of restored aristocracy for the family. She tears apart the school in a rage, and now travels the Noxian hinterlands as a wandering rebel, intent on someday crushing the Noxian Empire that did this. To her. As a design, there's a lot to like about Rel. The transforming horse slash armor is a really cool feature, the hair is a strong visual, there's a good silhouette design, and her yellow and black is a good mix between affinity and contrast with Noxus's black and red color scheme. On the downside, for someone who's so defined by teenage rage and rebellion, I wish her design looked more, well, teenage, edgy, and aggressive. Especially her horse armor has smooth, clean lines that, to me, just look too militaristically disciplined for the character. My grade is your teenage metal emo face millennial who's watching this. Gen Z, I don't know what your deal is, imagine your own grade. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Oh hey Sobek, nice of you to join us! Renekton is the brother of Nasus, a famous warrior with a tendency to give in to his rage, who nonetheless protected the sickly Nasus for most of his life. When Nasus was chosen for ascension, Renekton carried him into the Sun Disk's magic, expecting to be obliterated, but was ascended instead. During Serath's coup, Renekton volunteered to be sealed in with the Magus to hold him captive, but over a thousand years, Serath corrupted Renekton's mind and drove him mad with lies of Nasus as a betrayer. Legends of Runeterra implies that Renekton could still recover himself at least enough to coexist with his brother, but for now, the Butcher of the Sands wants nothing but his brother lying dead in the desert. As the design, just as Nasus is unambiguously Anubis, Renekton is unambiguously Sobek, and or also a furry, or scaly, I believe is the correct term. And he doesn't go much beyond that, he is for better or worse exactly the buff, angry crocodile man that you would expect from his basic description, with his most unique feature ultimately being his weapon, which looks sort of like a Klingon Batleth. I wish both he and his brother would push the boat out harder on looking unique, but oh well. My grade is this Kate Beaton comic. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Rengar is of Astaya, that's a League of Legends furry, obsessed with hunting the most dangerous game of all, which is Space Bug. Born the runt of the litter to a clan of hunters, he was neglected by his father as a shameful failure, and then abused by an adoptive father who did teach him how to hunt. Fortunately, all this misery didn't affect him at all. Oh no, wait! It turned him into an obsessive lunatic whose only pleasure in life is the thrill of the hunt and who murdered his own birth father for being too cowardly to hunt Cossacks himself. Oh dear! Cossacks and Rengar are now two of a kind, mirror versions of one another, each obsessed with murdering the other to grow stronger, acting out a perverse parody of survival of the fittest in 
every fight. As a design, Rengar is epic cat furry. His anatomy is the most animalistic of the Vestaya champions, with his leonine features being used to exaggerate for him a big upper body, his braids imitating the bulk of a lion's mane. He is over-adorned with spikes, skulls, bones, teeth, and trophies, and between that and the glowing badass eye patch, it's all a little edgelordy, but it works for the character who is, after all, that kind of guy. Migrate is the Alien vs. Predator franchise, but not the Predator itself. It's too cool for Rengar. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Riven is a former Noxian soldier. Once fiercely committed to the Noxian ideals, she participated in the invasion of Ionia and witnessed unspeakable war crimes done in the name of Empire. Disgusted, she shattered her own magical blade and went into self-imposed exile, eventually becoming the adoptive daughter of a pair of Ionian farmers. Some pasts can't stay buried, though, and Noxus eventually comes for Riven and her rune blade, which LeBlanc has some interest in recovering. Riven surrenders to avoid bloodshed on Ionian soil, and last we saw her, she was in chains in a Reckoner arena kicking the crap out of Draven. As a design, Riven is a very 2011 champion. Her proportions are awkward, her aesthetic is all over the place, and the themes of her story don't come through. Legends of Runeterra and recent media have updated her, smartly contrasting her armor and sword with an aggressively simplified outfit. Here, she looks at once too simply dressed to be a warrior, but also too warlike to be a simple farmer. There's a tension there. And with the, in my opinion, brilliant addition of that smear of Black Furiosa eyeshadow, her design excellently reads as a John Wick situation. Someone who's chosen a life of peace and pacifism and gods have mercy on your soul if you ever motivate them to choose violence. She cannot get a visual update soon enough, but once she does, my grade will be the I'm thinking I'm back monologue. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ah, Rumble, you precious little trash goblin. Rumble doesn't have a lore. The bio that he has currently is outdated and non-canon, and consequently it's hard to know how to evaluate him. Riot's direction seems to be making him a Shereman Yortle who builds his janky mech from scrap from Piltover, which, okay. What does seem consistent is that he's a classic little guy who resents being looked down on, and who loves using his mechanical skills and giant mech to stand up to bullies and assholes. As a design, he is janky. And of course, he's supposed to be. His robot is supposed to be made from scrap and junk, but even from that perspective, that's not really what it looks like to me. This doesn't look like a scrap crappy junk mech built by a resourceful scavenger who knows what they're doing, it looks like a bunch of perfectly intact pieces put together at random with no design sense or intent, and there is a difference. This looks like the work of a kid who took apart four different action figures and glued them back together wrong, not the work of someone who's cleverly repairing trash thrown away by others. Basically, its design is a decade old now, and it's really beginning to show. My grade is someone playing the Pacific Rim theme and getting all of the notes wrong. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Yeah, this crossover between the Blue Man Group and CC Top was a better idea on paper. Rise is an ancient wandering sorcerer, tasked by himself with containing weapons of magical mass destruction called World Runes. He saw firsthand the absolute horror of the Rune Wars, and how the World Runes that made the world can just as easily undo it as well, and so now he travels to every odd and remote location in the world to find and secure them before they can fall into the wrong hands. His primary competition in that goal is Keegan Road, also known as Brand, Rise's former apprentice until being tempted by the power of a World Rune himself. Centuries of loneliness and loss has left Rise a burdened man, and he's always struggling with the temptation of the power that he has sworn to guard. As a design, Rise is fine. Blue skin, weird tattoos, big scroll, bushy beard, yep, that sure looks like a sorcerer to me, all right. I like that his clothes are simple and practical, reflecting the humility that is necessary to pursue his quest in his life as a traveler, but mostly I just kind of wish he had some scars or battle damage visible on his body from all the hardship he has seen, or trinkets, souvenirs, and magical artifacts that he's picked up in his travels, but again, eh, he's fine. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Hey, Capcom can't sue you if you just gender swap your Dante clone. Samira is a mercenary, both by trade and by heart. A Shuriman immigrant to Noxus who made a living as an acrobat, she found the thrill of battle when she was a soldier and became so addicted that she made a life as a thrill-seeking adrenaline junkie mercenary, reveling in her own ability to walk away from even the dumbest of decisions, mostly unscathed. She has worked both for and against every major faction in Noxus, but her undeniable skills keep her in demand, most recently by the Black Rose, who hired her to track down Rel. As a design, Samira is the hot, sexy fantasy babe archetype I'm always complaining about in these videos, except for her, it works. Being the coolest mother and the hottest piece of ass in any room she walks into is part of Samira's power fantasy, just as surely as it is Bayonetta's or Dante's. And as a consummate cocky show-off, Samira's perfect makeup and flashy outfits fits her concept perfectly. My only quibble is I wish she had some cool-ass battle scars besides just the missing eye, but yeah, no, Samira kicks ass and I love her design. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Sichuan is the leader of the Winter's Claw, a tribe that believes in violence and power above all else, and as such, she's a natural enemy of the peacemaking Avarosans. What an irony that her and Ash used to be each other's closest friends and sworn sisters. Sichuan's mother abandoned her early in life, chasing the love of another man, who turns out to be Udyr, actually, and Sichuan was raised by her unloving grandmother instead. When Sichuan's mother returned and took over the tribe and proved every bit as unloving as her grandmother had been, Sichuan had enough and challenged her mother for leadership. She won, but her heart was irrevocably heartened, and she now believes only power can secure the future of her tribe, for which reason she has allied herself with the brutal Volibear. As a 
design, Sejuani is pretty solid. She's a powerful frontline warrior from the Frail Yord, and she dresses like it with heavy furs and metal plate, and her giant boar, Bristle, gives her an edge of animal savagery to boot. The broken horn on her helm is also a great detail to show her willingness to get into the thick of it. The vulnerable cleavage in the middle of her chest is a bit silly, but it's not a deal breaker. Her femininity is important to the character, even if I would say that that gets shown off plenty by the boob plate and giving her any visible vulnerability kind of goes against the spirit of the character. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Senna was once upon a time the quintessential fridged girlfriend of League of Legends. She used to exist in the lore primarily as a motivation for Lucian to get really mad and chase Thresh around all the time, but Riot eventually thought better of it and made her a champion. Possessed by what seems to be a part of Diego's wife's soul, the Black Mist has chased Senna all her life, leading to her decision to become a Sentinel of Light and fight back. She was trapped for years in Thresh's Lantern, but when she escaped, she brought with her the ability to manipulate the lost souls of the Black Mist and fight back against the Ruined King's control. As a design, Senna is pretty good. She has the standard League of Legends fantasy babe body type and title of the pants for some reason, which, yeah, fine, but if you give any design a giant f***ing cannon, it'll always look at least 120% cooler to me. Her ethereal ghostly cloak is a cool visual as well, but I just wish her dual alive and dead nature was more visible on her design, like if some parts of her actual body was spectral, scary, and shadow isles like Like many other champions, she has a concept that I think could be so much cooler if Riot would just dare to go a little more out there with it. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Seraphine's gonna need three videos, and this is part one where we talk about the hate. And we have to start with this because the discourse around her is frankly toxic, and I don't want people to misconstrue where I'm coming from. Seraphine is probably one of the most loudly hated champions in recent memory, and I don't think it's all deserved. There are legitimate criticisms. For example, it's pretty obvious that Riot decided to make KDA Seraphine first, and then shoved her Rune Terror incarnation into the game as an afterthought to justify the ultimate skin. As a music champion, she doesn't do a great job of differentiating herself from Sona, and her character design prioritizes making her a modern looking, adorable pop star over making her look like a natural part of Piltover and Zaun. Her lore is also a bit of a mess, accidentally implying that she's abusing the soul of one of Skarner's people to power her career, which had to be fixed with a hasty retcon. But here's the thing, when I get comments about Seraphine, there's like an 80% chance that I have to delete them because they contain some kind of slur or violent insult. There are champions with much worse lore who commit far worse crimes in their stories, and people aren't coming for them like this, so when this many gamers TM are in my comments calling a female character slurs, they are not doing it because of legitimate criticisms. Again, Seraphine can be argued to have plenty of problems, but calling her a or a or a or whatever isn't one of them, and I don't want that bullshit in my comments, so if you do that kind of thing, fuck off. Seraphine needs three videos, and this is part two where we talk about her lore. Seraphine is a young woman from Piltover, born with an unusually sensitive hearing. It begins as a disability for her, overwhelming her mind with sounds, feelings, and impressions, but she comes into contact with a hextech crystal containing the soul of a Bracker and Skarner's people, and while she doesn't quite know what she's found, its songs help guide her and learn to manage her senses. It helps her develop the ability to quite literally hear people's souls and resonate with them. As she becomes aware of the divisions tearing Piltover apart from Zaun, she decides to try and do something about it. Through music, she can move people's souls and cause them to connect with one another, and using the crystal that guided her to power an amplifier, she starts performing, hoping to heal the city she loves. My biggest problem with Seraphine's lore is that a singer with the ability to make people feel solidarity with one another is the world's most natural fit for a protest singer, and she should be treated in the lore as a major political force in Piltover, a threat to both people like Camille and Urgot. But instead, her story insists on framing her as a naive cheerleader, telling everyone to just make friends and get along while children in Zaun die in poison swamps so rich people in Piltover can live in wealth and comfort. Seraphine should be important, but Riot made her toothless. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Seraphine needs three videos, and this is part three where we talk about her design. Seraphine as a design is broadly speaking, like, all right. It is clear that Riot created her primarily to make KDA Seraphine, and my suspicion is that they worked backwards from the KDA design to create the Rune Terra version, essentially isekaiing a modern design into their fantasy game. The result of that is a character who just doesn't look like she fits into the world that she's living in. As a pop star, of course, her costumes are supposed to be out there and extravagant, but looking at her, it's hard to find any influence from the aesthetics of either Piltover or Zaun in her look, and when a love of the city she calls her home is the driving force that motivates her, that's kind of disappointing especially when her concept art shows versions that clearly understand the importance of connecting her to her home culture. I also think that between the long hair and the floating movement aesthetic, she overlaps weirdly too much with Sona, the only other music champion in the game who also has very long hair and floats. I feel like it must have been possible to make her more different than that. All of that being said, does Seraphine look like a bubbly, positive pop star who just wants everyone to get along and have a good time? Yes, her design is for its purposes. Fine. It's okay. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Born from a union between a Vestian woman and a Noxian man in the part of Ionia, suffering greatly under Noxian military occupation, Set found himself an outcast from both communities. And his life didn't improve when his father, a pit fighter, left to chase glory in foreign arenas. Set fights his own way to the top of the fighting pits and develops class consciousness just enough to realize that the real money is in owning the means of production. He stages a violent coup and now sits pretty as the king of vice in Noxian occupied Ionia, intent on never returning to his old life of loneliness and poverty. As a design, Set is a handsome, hunky anime boyfriend who happens to have animal ears. I know he's half Vestia, but it would have been nice to see his animal nature expressed a little bit more on him, like give him sharp 
fangs or body hair or a tail or something. Besides that, I quite like him. His design has himbo mama's boy energy, but he's also clearly dangerous enough that you might not want to say that to his face. His white and gold pants and sharp golden shoes bring something of a Yakuza vibe to his design without becoming too modern to work in League, and while for the hundredth time I'll reiterate that I wish the fighters of League of Legends had visible scars and battle damage, Set does look plausibly enough like a brawler to me that it's not a deal breaker, it's just a way that I think his character design could obviously be improved. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Shaco is barely a character. Even before the 2014 lore retcon, his story basically boiled down to a scary murder clown who kills people and nobody knows why. His current bio has him as a marionette corrupted by dark magic, but it's essentially an empty placeholder. He has no role in the lore, no connections to other champions, and no stories to his name, and it's been this way ever since he was added to the game 11 years ago. Ironically, this has accidentally made him somewhat unique in the game, the only champion with no actual story whatsoever, and a character who has no lore and exists for no reason could be an interesting concept for a horror-themed champion if I ever decide to, you know, do anything with him. As a design, though, Shaco is a murder clown. He's a jester with knives and big joker face who kills people and laughs about it. Checkerboard pattern, red and black, silly shoes, weird hat. If you've seen one of these, you've seen a million of them on DeviantArt, and literally nothing about Shaco's design is unique or especially compelling. I don't even know what to say about him. He's just the most obvious, overdone version of his own character archetype, and I can't find it in myself to have any strong feelings about him whatsoever. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Shen is a ninja who is also a tank, which, huh. He's the Eye of Twilight, a powerful role in the Order of the King who has arbiter between the material world and the spirit realm. League of Legends Jedi, basically, and if Shen is Obi-Wan, Zed is Anakin. When the King who refused to defend Ionia from Noxus, Shen holds true to the Order while Zed rebels and forms the Order of Shadows. Left to rebuild the ruins, Shen takes on Akali as an apprentice League of Legends Ahsoka, basically, until she too abandons the restrictive pacifism of the King who as a relic of the past. Shen still struggles with his role and with his many, many definitely heterosexual feelings about Zed, but remains steadfastly boring as the Eye of Twilight. Which extends to his character design, because Shen is a ninja, and that's kind of it. The interesting thing about him is that rather than be a slender, nimble acrobat, he's built like a brick house. He's a tank, not an assassin, and that is an interesting idea, albeit it's only really expressed with some armor and a more bulky form. Still, it is something. Where Zed has the cheesy 90s cartoon Shredder vibe, and Akali brings a modern street fashion sensibility, Shen is the boring, sensible, conservative standard model from which they deviate, and that's probably okay. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Shivana is a half-dragon born from an egg that was stolen by a human mage from a great elemental dragon. Why exactly that causes her to hatch as a humanoid is never explained, but her mother never forgets her. And when she grows up enough to spread her own wings, her mother kills her adoptive father and comes hunting her. By sheer coincidence, she finds Jarman IV wounded in the woods and saves his life in return for which he rallies a garrison of Damasian soldiers to defend her from her mother. Shivana eventually commits matricide, and safe at last, Jarvan takes her on as his personal retainer and potential love interest, which is awkward. As a design, Shivana is really cool in her splash art. In her actual character model, she's a skinny person purple girl in a rather silly looking armor, and her dragon form, which is supposed to be badass, powerful, and cool, looks gangly, fragile, and awkward. There's opportunities to do some really cool shit with Shivana by more fully mixing her human form with dragon attributes or playing with a more extreme contrast between her human and dragon forms, but as it stands in the game, she looks more like a Halloween costume than a fiery warrior channeling the elemental rage of dragons. Also, the romance with Jarvan, I run a country that wants to kill you for existing the fourth is weird. It's just weird. She deserves better. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. A brilliant scientist who peered into the mysteries of chemistry and physics, Singed found himself on the outs in Piltover when Hextech technology supplanted alchemy. Considering the use of magic a kind of scientific cheating, he lost the favor of Piltover's upper class and retreated his scientific practice to Zon, where rent is cheap and life is cheaper. With no ethical oversight to hamper his pursuits, he rapidly descended into monstrous experimentation on the homeless and destitute, taking chem barons and killers as clients for his poisons. Eventually, Noxus takes notice and he creates for them horrifying chemical weapons with which they devastate Ionia civilians and ecology. Not content with mere war crimes, he has turned his attention to biological experiments, longing for immortality to continue his scientific pursuits forever. Warwick is one failed experiment in that direction, but dozens or hundreds did not survive his brutality. Pity that as a design he looks like a complete cartoon character decked out in bright colors, incomprehensible spikes, and nonsensical Warcraft pauldrons with a giant shield, because this frail dying mad scientist is a tank on Summoner's Rift, so he stole some horde gear to go raiding, I guess. Singed is one of the darkest characters in the game and absolutely one of the most sinister, and his design utterly fails to communicate his menace or seriousness, which sucks. He needs a rework. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Once a terrifying warlord from one of the original tribes of Noxus, Scion charged mercilessly into battle with the Damasians despite his armies falling around him. He's killed, but not before he tears the crown of Jarvan I from his head and chokes the king to death with his bare hands. Metal. Noxus is not a place to let ethics get in the way of conquest, though, and former Grand General Borum Darkwell has the Black Rose reanimate Scion as an undead battle master. Trouble is, with his mind deteriorated and his rage amplified, Scion has a tendency to slaughter as many allies as enemies, and so eventually he is locked away in his tomb again with the losses decimate morale. Enter Swain, who sees in Scion a valuable resource and who unearths him again to be deployed as a weapon of terror to punish Noxian 
territories that dare to rebel. Siren himself feels nothing anymore but painful fragmented memories and an unquenchable thirst for destruction and death, and a fading consciousness that he used to be more than a mere thing. As a design, Siren is pretty brilliant, honestly. The bloody furnace in his stomach makes him clearly artificial, the giant surgery scar makes him clearly undead, the dagger in his head with a streaming ribbon is a compelling visual, and the crown of Jarvan the first grafted onto his jaw is just badass. Sion is cool as hell, and I'm glad he's not doing a bad Arnold Schwarzenegger impression anymore. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Sivir is a warrior who really, really doesn't want to be a princess. She's a mercenary, a tomb raider, and killer for hire of Shurima, the best of the best, wielding a unique crossblade that once belonged to an ascended god warrior. Sivir has an infinite list of enemies and a fierce desire for independence, all of which makes her perhaps the worst possible person to inherit an empire. Unbeknownst to her, she's the last living descendant of a seer's line, and when she was mortally wounded while raiding his tomb, her blood brought his spirit back to save her life. For that act of selflessness, a seer is restored as an ascendant and rebuilt his empire. Sivir, though, wants nothing to do with grand destinies and is now on the run both from a seer's earnest attempts to adopt her and Sarad's armies that see her as a threat. As a design, Sivir is Sina War warrior princess, to the point that that's literally one of her skins. She's also pretty pale for a lady who spends her life running around in the sunniest desert on the planet, and she dresses unwisely for her environment. There's a reason desert-dwelling people usually cover up, and it's called sunburn and skin cancer. She's also yet another battle-hardened, lifelong mercenary fighting for her life in a brutal environment who has no scars or battle damage to speak of, which I insist is still dumb. I do think Sivir looks cool and badass, but to me her design is doing very shoddy storytelling about her life and her character. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Skarner is a Brackern, a race of crystal creatures who form a network of gestalt consciousnesses between their crystal cores, sharing their thoughts, feelings, and memories through resonant song. The Brackern go into defensive hibernation to avoid the rune wars and sleep for centuries, until one day Skarner is awoken by a great collective scream of psychic pain. Humans have come with explosives and pickaxes, mining the crystal cores from his people's bodies. Skarner survives, but the rest of his race is rendered dead or comatose by the trauma, and the thieves themselves flee with many of his people's souls. In Piltover, those crystals become known as Hextech crystals. Most modern crystals are synthetic reproductions, but the originals still exist in that place calling out to Skarner's mind, and he is determined to recover them. It was Camille's family, by the way, who were responsible for that crime, and part of her work is keeping it covered up. As a design, Skarner is a crystal scorpion, and not a very creative one. He's really just kind of rocky and weirdly colored, and looks more like a random RPG mob than a thinking character. A lot more could be done with his design to incorporate the unique structures of crystals or features like translucency and musical resonance. Everything that makes him unique in the lore is missing from his design, and it's a pity because the lore is really cool, and I hope Riot doesn't retcon it when they rework him. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Hey, did you know League of Legends was invented by Hatsona Miku? Sona is a foundling from a monastery in Ionia. Born mute with no voice, she instead found a way to express herself with music through her etval, a mystical instrument which was found with her when she was abandoned as a baby. When Noxus invades Ionia, Sona is among the refugees who flee, ending up in Damasia and coming into the care of a Damasian noble family. Growing up, she earns a deserved reputation for being a virtuoso, using her music to bring joy to her listeners, but she must hide the magical nature of her instrument and abilities from the fascistic mage seekers. Being protected by a noble family, of course, makes that a lot easier because Damasia loves nothing like it loves hypocrisy and noble privilege. In the wake of the mage rebellion, Sona is determined to use gifts to bring healing and reconciliation to her divided country, using her gift for music to bridge the emotional divide, and hey, is it just me or does this all sound familiar somehow? As a design, Sona is, yeah, fine. The massive cleavage feels a bit unnecessary, the Hatsune Miku reference is unavoidable, and having a bass and treble clef on her dresses may be a bit obvious, but my real complaint is that her instrument just looks like strings nailed to a table. It's based on like a Guqing or Gusheng, but those instruments have soundboards and tuning pegs and variable string links. This thing to me just doesn't look like it was made to play music at all. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Soraka is a celestial, the same species of creature responsible for creating the aspects and giving ascension magic to Shirima. From her home in the stars, she looked at Runeterra and was like, boy, sure is a lot of murder and war going on down there, I should do something about that. And so she made a mortal body for herself, a Vestaya body specifically, and though her celestial magic burns her mortal form inside and out, she wanders Runeterra, healing the sick, guiding mortals who have lost their way and marveling at the chaos of life in a sort of New Age way, like, wow, all this suffering and misery some are part of a grander symmetry in the universe and therefore it's actually good, question mark? As a design, Soraka is, well, she's a skinny hot lady with goat legs and a horn, and for me, like, if she absolutely absolutely has to be eye candy, and I don't think she does, but if you insist, the nurturing, self-sacrificing, guiding healer as old as the universe is surely League of Legends' best candidate for a hot MILF design. Like, if she must be sexy, make her sexy in a way that suits the character archetype, surely. Personally, I like Soraka's celestial design in the Realms of Runeterra book a lot better. This is unique, odd, interesting, and kinda hot without being boring about it. Current Soraka, though, eh, just too basic in my opinion. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Oh, hello, Demon Daddy. I'm about to make your simps mad at me. Swain is a tyrant of Noxus, a former battlefield general who got his ass handed to him by Aurelia, and went and did a pact with a demon about it to receive a snazzy new arm and superpowers, because if you can't win in a fair fight, you can always cheat. Using his connections as a noble and with an assist from Draven, he assassinates the leader of Noxus and takes his place. Then, with support from Darius's army, he establishes a Roman style triumvirate to cement his power and has revitalized Noxian conquest, launching a second invasion of Ionia and deploying spies and assassins against Demacia. He also keeps Sion around to use as a weapon of terror against his own territories if they rebel. Fun! As a designer fully approved, 
approve of straight up stealing the character design of Lucius Malfoy from Harry Potter because turfs shouldn't have nice things. Swain is the primo silver fox daddy of the game and incorporates a distinctly modern look with his long overcoat and riding boots, which goes well with his visionary ahead of his time gimmick, but is also pulling from the aesthetics of 20th century European fascism to visually indicate that the dude should not be understood as a hero. Swain is a fantastic villain design and he deserves his simps, just don't be too eager to swallow his, uh, propaganda. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Silas is a mage who was taken from his parents as a child and used as a human magic detector, allowing the Damasian mage seekers to find, arrest, or kill other mages living in hiding. When one day he intervenes to save a child from a murderous mage seeker, a terrible magical accident happens for which he is framed and imprisoned. After a decade of imprisonment on the day of his execution, he steals magic from Lux and uses it to kill his executioners and escape, starting a violent rebellion of oppressed mages against the tyranny of Damasia, which makes him a villain? Question mark? Anyway, Silas is right, actually. As a design, Silas is a shirtless hottie with plenty of free time for crossfit and healthy dieting in prison, apparently. My dude looks weirdly healthy for a man kept in chains and deprivation for a decade. This is another one of those cases where a focus on making the character appealing and attractive runs counter to what you would expect from his story. Like, I don't have a problem with him being muscled and strong, but he should look malnourished and kind of gaunt, at least, after all that he's been through. Outside of that, his design kind of rules. A prisoner literally using the chains of his oppressor to fight back, that's a cool thematic, and the ragged prison pants collar and wrapped feet give him a look of desperation that fits his story. Be nice if Riot stopped both sides in his lore, though. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Syndra's magic is powered by her anger and resentment, emotions which she has an infinite well of due to being treated her entire life as a burden, an object, or a problem to be managed, constantly the target of abuse by other people who refuse to see her as a full person. Turns out, if you do that enough to someone, they eventually gain the ability to throw mountains around with their mind. Her rampaging negative energy has a dangerous effect on reality, though, and seeking to establish equilibrium, the spirit of Ionia imprisons her in a magical pool of water to slumber for decades. Then Noxus invades, and some overly optimistic rebellious Ionians decide to free Syndra in the hope that she will help them resist the invasion. Doesn't work out that way, Syndra pulls a castle out of the ground and flies away with it to do something destructive, probably. As a design, Sintra is a classic femme fatale evil sorceress, all in black with purple and a bit of bondage gear aesthetic, a crown, and her titties out. It works, I suppose, well enough for its purposes, but I feel like it lacks the vibes of outrage and angry outbursts that are supposed to characterize her personality. She looks controlled, not impulsive, structured, not reactive. I think something more raw and wild would suit her character better, personally. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Hey baby, got a vor kink? Do you want one? Tom Kench is a demon of addiction and despair. He tempts people with their wildest fantasies and dreams, and when they sign his devil's contract, he gives them everything they could have ever wanted, only to consume their misery and despair like a fine meal as he slowly takes it away again, piece by piece. And once his victim is fully broken, drained of every drop of misery they have to offer, he eats them as well. I'm always a bit frustrated when character designs use fatness as synecdoche for evil and gluttony. It's a tire trope, and fat people get enough shit from society without this coding and media reinforcing ugly stereotypes. Personally, I think emaciated skinniness makes a better visual coding for insatiable hunger, but even in spite of all of this, Tom Kench is absolutely one of my favorite designs in the game. He's a literal catfish who literally catfishes people, merged with a classic Americana archetype, the smooth-talking riverboat swindler, hiding his monstrous nature behind good old polite southern affability. His waistcoat rings, tiny top had an enormous carnivorous smile, completes the sense of theatricality that gives him his charm. And come on, man, his champion theme? That's vibes for days! I love this champion. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ah, my girl Talia. She comes from a tribe of Shuriman weaver nomads, but rather than weave wool, Talia weaves the very rock of the earth itself. Traveling the world to learn about her power, she's taken by Noxians and eventually sent to Ionia to be used as a human weapon. Refusing, she escapes and meets Yasuo, drinking away his trauma. The two wanderers become companions, and Yasuo uses his knowledge of wind magic to teach Talia control and discipline, and in teaching her, puts some of his own demons to rest. Talia eventually returns to Shurima just in time to see Zerath and Asiya rise from history and tear the continent apart. Talia was all set to be important to that story, accompanying Sivir and Nasus to resist Zerath, but Riot lost interest and left the story hanging which is a classic Riot move. As a design, Talia is one of Riot's attempts to diversify their female characters, and a bloody successful one at that. She has a unique face with a strong nose and brows, and a skinny, tomboyish body type that sets her apart from other more generic champions. Her long coat sleeves festooned with rocks emphasize her dancer-like weaving movement, and the red-gold and brown color scheme identifies her beautifully with the dry earth and desert. Talia is a reminder that just as popular design is not always good, good design is not always popular. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Talon is an Oxian street kid who learned to kill to survive, and then he got so good at killing that he managed to turn it into a career, which hey, good for him. Taken in by Katarina's family, he's a racist and assassin for Noxus traveling the world to murder for whoever is in charge. When Katarina is marked as persona non grata by her own father, it's Talon who's sent to kill her. He fails, although he does give her that big red scar, and frustrated by his failure, he becomes obsessed with tracking and killing Katarina, whose wild, impulsive style he finds intellectually inferior to his logical, measured, and extremely brain-powered smart guy killing. So yeah, the dude is basically written as a creepy stalker incel, but obsessed with murder instead of harassing Twitch streamers for having breasts. As a design, 
Iron Talon is extremely generic, even for a League of Legends champion. Assassin's Creed hood, wristplate, and then metal boots and a cape with metal spikes, the rattling of which must surely give him disadvantage on his sneak checks. I do think the spiky cape is probably his coolest and most unique visual, but Talon to me just doesn't look like a silent and obsessive perfectionist killer. He looks like the protagonist of a C-tier PS3 action game. He looks loud and ostentatious, not quiet and introverted. He could do with an update. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Maybe he's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Tarek began life as a Damasian soldier, a good friend to Garen, whose aesthetic sense of wonder about the world unfortunately made him a bad commander. His inattention saw his entire unit killed, and as punishment he was made to endure the Crown of Stone. A fancy Damasian turned for Go Climb Mount Targon, and if you don't die, we won't kill you. Tarek makes the climb, haunted by the voices of those he failed to protect, and reaching the apex he is chosen and transformed into the aspect of the Protector, charged with defending the beauty and preciousness of life on Rune Terra. As a design, Tarek is Fabio, a very large, handsome, well-manicured man with a huge cleavage and generally very soft aesthetic. Identified to blues and purples because even if Rai won't say it out loud, he's definitely coded as bisexual. He's also kept quite simple, no elaborate armor, fairly understated fashion, with his floating gems and giant mace providing visual flavor. This relative vulnerability to me does a good job of showing him as a warrior who's not interested in war and gives him a peaceful and relatively pacifist vibe compared to, say, spiky McSharp Edge characters like Darius. Oh, and common misconception, just because he's hot doesn't mean he's sexualized. Base Tarek is not a sexualized design. Armor of the Fifth Age Tarek, on the other hand. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. All hail the Lord Satan! Dead be thy name, and cursed be thy left! Like Rumble, Timo has no real lore. What he's got is desperately outdated, and since he's never been part of any meaningful stories, we know next to nothing about what the deal is supposed to be with this guy. In the absence of anything official, the community has stepped up to meme him a personality, specifically the personality of an UNREPENDENT HELL DEMON WHOSE ONLY PLEASURE IS OUR PAIN. It seems like he's supposed to be a self-appointed scout of Bandle City, cheerfully charting the world, picking up interesting mushrooms and making poison out of them to kill people with. He's got a greenhouse of them and so on, and seems to have a friend group going with Tristana, Lulu, and Corky, but besides that, he's kind of an empty character. As a design, he's also not great. He's a hamster in a hat with a blowpipe. He's become iconic to the game by sheer force of time, but his design is a clunky mess with very little cohesion or storytelling, in my opinion. I like that he carries around maps, I guess, but yeah, no, Teemo's design sucks. Make Devil Teemo canon instead. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. The Blessed Isles were once home to an order of monks who kept vaults of magical artifacts along with the fabled Waters of Life. In those vaults worked a caretaker named Thresh, who was an asshole, petty, entitled, narcissistic, and rather sadistic. He kept his job because he was good at it, but nobody wanted to be around him, and certainly nobody ever wanted to promote him. Enter King Viego of Camavor, looking for someone corrupt enough to lead him to the Waters of Life. And who should sense career advancement but Thresh, who gleefully opens Viego's way to the sacred pool where he causes the ruination. And the ruination reveals the true shape of Thresh's soul, a cruel, vindictive torture whose only joy in unlife is causing other people pain and misery. As a design, Thresh is cool-looking and highly detailed, but simply executed. Pitch black and glowing green turns him into essentially a walking silhouette with a bit of steel gray for accents and a bit of restraint imagery in the bone cage armor. The bone and skull motifs are maybe a little bit He-Man villain for the modern state of the game, but even if he's a little bit dated, Thresh remains an extremely well-executed monster villain. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Tristana is a curious yordle who spent a long time wandering Rune Terra, marveling at its wonders, and became especially fascinated with the martial technology and armies that marched across the land. One day, though, she witnesses what seems like a Noxian sorcerer destroying a Bandle Wood, a magical grove that serves as a portal to Bandle City. The magical backlash from this destruction causes pain throughout the yordle's spiritual realm and hurts Tristana to her soul, and she resolves to protect her people from anyone doing anything like that ever again. She commissions a cannon from a Biltwater gunsmith and appoints herself the defender of Bandle City, protecting especially the Bandle woods from mortal destruction. As a design, Tristana is a classic short stack with a giant weapon design similar to Poppy, but where Poppy is serious, Tristana is more of a cartoon character. She wears protective blast padding, but has a cute crop top, which is not adequate explosives protection for someone who rocket jumps, but like Kled, she's clearly meant to be understood in more of a Looney Tunes kind of way, so it works. Interestingly, her character model is also more human than Poppy, with her giant eyes and enormous pupils giving her almost a sort of alien energy. Doesn't seem intentional, but it could have been a cool direction to take the Yordles once upon a time. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Trundle is the king of the ice trolls in the Freljord, self-proclaimed anyway. Smarter than the average troll, which is not saying much, he was thrown out of his tribe for having clever ideas above his station. Wandering the wastelands, he dreamt of greater things than only food and fornicating, and quite by accident, he found his way into the heart of Lysandra's domain. Apparently immune to the voices of the Watchers, possibly by simply being unable to comprehend them, Lysandra sees an opportunity with Trundle and gives him a great club of true ice and tells him that he is to be king of all trolls, and that he should unite the troll tribes to form an alliance with her. Trundle takes the club, accepts his newfound grand destiny, and quite successfully beats to death every troll that stands between him 
and kingship, which, to be fair, is how all monarchies are established. As a design, Trundle is a troll in the classic Nordic tradition, being an awkwardly shaped craggy and lumpy thing with wild hair, big teeth, and a fat nose. Interestingly, he's not like a 12-foot-tall, hyper-muscled bodybuilder. He has more of a wiry build, still powerful, but looks a bit more agile, which I like. Legends of Runeterra, though, put him on a protein diet and sent him to the gym. Benefits of being a king, I guess. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. It's hard to know exactly what to make of Trindamir. His backstory is that his tribe was wiped out by an attack from Aatrox, and that Aatrox did something, maybe blood magic, to him that gave him the ability to do the Barbarian Rage ability from Dungeons and Dragons. Then he got taken in by the Everosans, and Ash took him as a husband, mostly as a political play to get the other tribes off her back about it, but eventually they did find a fondness for each other, and now Trindamir fights for peace in Everosa's name. He's alienated within the tribe, though, because a man who is literally too angry to die who regenerates from fatal wounds all the time is kind of freaky, to be fair. On top of that, he's also maybe obsessed with getting revenge on Aatrox, and this is part of Aatrox's plan because he wants something to use Trindamir as a vessel. Riot has never really shown any interest in explaining it. Trinbia's character design shares a lot of problem with Ash, except arguably worse. He runs around half-naked on the frozen tundra with bare metal against his skin, and he isn't even an iceborne. And his aesthetic looks nothing like either the Averrosan tribe he fights for, Ash, who he's married to, or the Freljord in general. Again, I will say the scars, especially awkward-looking scars from his tissue healing way too quickly to be natural, would help his storytelling a lot, but overall, he just looks like baby's first barbarian, with absolutely no thought put into his design outside of the most standard, obvious trope features. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ah, Twisted Fate, the second most married man in League of Legends, second only to Graves himself. Born to riverboat nomads, he experienced bigotry everywhere he went and took to being a card shark, partly out of a strange spiritual attraction to card magic, but also partly to stick it to the bastards who look down on him. Sadly, he's a bit of a coward by nature, and when his tribe is assaulted over one of his schemes, he runs to save his own hide, for which abandonment they abandon him in turn. He becomes a drifter and eventually strikes up a close, very close partnership with Graves. Eventually, a heist goes wrong and Graves gets caught, while Fate again runs away, for which Graves has never really forgiven him. Graves and Fate eventually reconcile in the middle of misfortunes builds water revolution, and they've been happily married ever since. As a design, Fate is more cowboy than either pirate or river nomad, and his base design just doesn't mesh with Bilgewater very well, to the point that recent animated shorts drop his duster and change his shirt and waistcoat to stop him looking completely out of place. He's yet another one of those embodying archetype without challenging it characters, but his archetype just doesn't fit his environment. He needs an update, I think, but not that much of one. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. A plague rat by birth, a connoisseur of filth by passion, Twitch is a paranoid and mutated rat that walks upright and roots through the dregs of Zaun for treasures only he truly values. Armed with a chem-powered crossbow, Twitch is not afraid to get his paws dirty as he builds a throne of refuse in his kingdom of filth, endlessly plotting the downfall of humanity. I don't need to summarize Twitch's lore, because that is quite literally all of it. He's a plague rat what wants your trash, and Riot has never shown any interest whatsoever in telling stories about him, which sucks. As a design, Twitch is, well, he's a plague rat what wants your trash. He's a pretty simple Skaven-style rat furry, kitted out in what I would call a pretty standard steampunk rogue aesthetic with a long green coat, red scarf, a crossbow and goggles, as well as ruined gloves and boots his claws have torn holes in. My only complaint is that his clothes could maybe look a little bit more ragged and dirty, but it's a nitpick. He's one of the most confidently competent designs in the game. He doesn't innovate, he just does his thing really really well. Plus, his D&D skin is the single cutest thing in the entire League of Legends universe, and I will fight you over that. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Hey, did you know that Udyr is Sejuani's father? Well, sort of, not biologically, but definitely socially. Udyr is a spirit walker, that's a type of Freljord shaman who communes with the spirits of that place. Trouble is, he's an extremely powerful one, which in reality means he's incredibly vulnerable to being overwhelmed by animal minds and spirits, which can get you mind controlled by gods like Volibear, and that gets ugly. When the Frostguard slaughters his tribe because they hate shamans, he strikes up a relationship with Sejuani's mother, until one day Lee Sin comes along, traveling on his own journey of penance. The two of them share a struggle with spirits, Lee with his dragon and Udyr with the everything else, and Lee takes Udyr to Ionia to learn from the masters of that land. Eventually, he returns to the Freljord and joins Sichuani in the Winter's Claw to guide and protect her from the Volibear's influence, at great risk to his own mind. As a design, Udyr is terrible. He's up for a redesign and we'll revisit him then, but his weird Heihachi Gi and clogs look extremely silly with a bearskin cap and paw print design. He's just incredibly clunky. His story is actually one of the better ones in League, and hopefully soon his design will somewhat match it. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Yeah, I watched The Dark Knight Rises 2 ride, and that movie kinda sucked. Urgot is a former Noxian executioner. Fully bought into Noxus's ridiculous might makes right propaganda, his beliefs shatter when he's ousted as part of Swain's coup and sent to work in the poisonous prison mines of Zaun. He is reborn in that darkness, molded by it, and eventually overthrows the prison warden and becomes obsessed with purging himself and everything around him of weakness, which he defines as an inability to survive the deranged violence of lunatics like Urgot. He has his body progressively replaced with machinery and becomes effectively a cult leader, building a following partly of fanatical social Darwinist fascists and partly of the desperate and down 
downtrodden of Zaun who think that Urgot will strike back against the Kimberans and upper classes of Piltover to free them. Thank God League of Legends isn't a political game, you might think the story is trying to say something. As a design, Urgot is Spiderbot Bane with a bit of Immortion Joe thrown in for flavor, and the Mad Max vibes work really well for him because that's the kind of villain that he is. A post apocalyptic anarcho fascist Raider King, except he's in the pre apocalypse trying to make the end of the world happen. His shotgun knees and meat grinder stomach are the perfect mix of silly, dumb, and f scary, and who doesn't like a good arm cannon? Urgot is a great villain. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in depth videos. There is a Sadarkin who's sealed inside of a magic bow, but he's possessing the merged body of two Ionian hunters, Valmar and Kai, who are both men and who are lovers. There is struggles with the hunters for control of the body, and sometimes the Darkin is in control, sometimes it is the hunters. All of this was added in an update entirely outside of the game, so when you're on Summoner's Rift, the Darkin is all you get. Varys, as far as anyone knows, does not have a sexuality of any kind, and therefore is not an openly queer character. Darkin lore is a bit convoluted, but basically they're the ascendant of Shirima, like Nasus and Renekton, who got corrupted by a thousand years of blood, magic, and trauma, and now they're evil and want to kill everything. As a design, Varys is. well, I don't know, really. He's fine? His bow is scary and demonic, and the half-possessed look works, but why is he possessed from the waist down? The red scarf is a cool iconic feature, but what's with that weird chest strap? What's with the circlet? He suffers a lot from having had a full lore retcon without any design retcon to actually do, you know, storytelling for that lore. He's not bad as such, I don't think. His design just feels like there's not much there there. And the absence of Valmar and Kai, who are so key to his story, is a baffling omission. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Sylvain is pretty evil, although she might be getting better, question mark? She was born to wealthy Demacians and lived a life of privilege and comfort until her 16th birthday when she comes home to find Evelyn standing over the brutalized corpses of her parents. Evelyn disappears and Vane, orphaned, puts all her money and resources into turning herself into a dark avenger, hunting both demons and mages in revenge, and yes, she literally is League of Legends Batman. She travels to the Freljord where she's saved by a monster hunter named Frey who teaches her everything about hunting monsters and demons. They develop a mother-daughter bond and Vane even takes Frey back to Demacia, but when a hunt goes wrong and Frey uses magic to transform herself and save Vane's life, Vane murders Frey in cold blood and finds that she quite enjoys the sensation of doing that. Anyway, now she's a light sentinel and she's apparently lightening up a bit, but yeah, kind of evil as a baseline. As a design, she's, well, she's designed on comic book aesthetics. The Batman parallel isn't accidental, and she absolutely looks cool with a lot of iconic elements. The stiletto heels, skin-tight bodysuit, and extremely modern-looking sunglasses work in the context of her extremely schlock comic comic book concept, although I think it works a lot less well in the context of League of Legends as a whole. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Yes, Vigar, this is a short joke. Vigar has a pretty dark story. Once a Yordle who lived with human mages to learn celestial magic, he was captured by Mordekaiser during the Warlord's Dark Reign and forced to use his magic to do dark and terrible things. The trauma and isolation from the Yordle spiritual realm eventually twisted Vigar's kind spirit into what he is now, a cackling evil lunatic who wants to take over the world as its greatest villain. Or is he? He travels the world, targeting the strongest and most evil overlords he can find, using his formidable magic to drive them out, and declares himself a Dark Lord instead, only to be thanked by the villagers for driving out the Dark Lord who was oppressing them. However evil he tries to be, he just can't seem to get it right. Just as Kled is a kind of personified parody of Noxus, Vigar is a personified parody of Mordekaiser, and that is a poignant kind of revenge, honestly. So that's a really cool story concept, but as a design, Vigar is literally just a Final Fantasy black mage who got magnetized and rolled through a scrapyard. His silly, simplistic design really works with his story, it works as a parody of Mordekaiser, but it's still a really clunky and simplistic design that is desperately showing its age. I'd be excited for an update for this guy. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Please don't make tentacle jokes in the comments. Vilkos is a Voidborn, a cosmic horror creature from the Anti-Universe. His purpose is to collect information and knowledge and to understand what the physical realm is so the Void can destroy it. The way that he does this is by ripping it apart with his arms and lasers and studying every individual atom as it is deconstructed into nothingness. He does this to rocks, he does this to people. Unlike more feral beasts like Cho'Gath or Rek'Sai, though, his job requires an intelligence of his own and thus he has a very distinct personality and perhaps more complex motivations of his own. He seems, reading between the lines, reluctant to end the universe, at least until he's done studying it, for example. As a design, he's a flying eyeball with arms. Given that his whole thing is studying things, i.e. looking at them, that kind of hyper-stylized literalization of his concept makes a lot of sense and works extremely well in my opinion. It's a very strong expression of his character, with the only caveat that he's maybe a little cartoony for cosmic horror. He does have this extremely cool bit of concept art though, showing him off as a much more otherworldly alien thing, and if he ever gets a design update, I hope that art is used as the basis. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Vive stands for Family Issues. Vive is a street kid from Zaun. Much of her backstory is going to be revealed in the upcoming Arcane animated series, but what we do know right now is that she grew up with her sister who will eventually become Jinx, although we don't know how that transformation happens. Vi does whatever she needs to survive, and that includes doing some crime. Until one day she's asked to commit a crime that will amount to multiple homicides. When she tries to back out, her gang leaves her for dead along with a group of miners that they were robbing. She picks up a pair of giant mining gauntlets, punches her way out, and beats her old gang senseless for what they did. Then she disappears, and when she shows up next, is alongside Caitlyn as an enforcer for the Wardens, the 
steampunk police. The implication is that she's working with Caitlyn for reasons related to why Jinx went over the edge. As a design, Vi is pretty damn solid. She mixes punky aesthetics with a cleaner Victorian Edwardian Piltover look. She's gorgeous without being over-sexualized, and while I think she's maybe a little bit overly noisy with visual detail, the pink hair and giant gauntlets create clear, iconic visual markers to read her design from. You see Vi and you're not really in doubt about what kind of person that she is, and that's one way to do good character design. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Viego is in two parts, and part one is about his story as a villain. Viego was never meant to be king. He was a spoiled, romantic second prince who only ever knew privilege until his brother died and saddled him with running a kingdom he had no interest in or understanding of. He meets Isolde, a peasant seamstress girl, and falls in love in what can only be described as a perfect Cinderella romance, and Viego becomes dependent on Isolde as the only person who will treat him with a soft, romantic love his sensitive soul craves in the Machiavellian power politics of Camavor. And it's important to understand that Viego loves Isolde deeply and genuinely, but he loves her as a prince loves a servant, like a child loves a favorite toy. When Isolde dies, he loses his comforter, and so he does what he thinks kings are entitled to do, and kills and destroys and ruins the world in the single-minded, romantic pursuit of getting back what he thinks is his. What makes him a good villain is that that is often the way of it. The most terrifying villains most of us will see in our lives are not Sauron or Thanos. They are narcissistic fools with protagonist syndrome who have been invested with the power to pursue their fantasies no matter the cost to everyone else. You will never meet a Mordekaiser, but a Viego could haunt your real life. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Viego's in two parts, part two is about his character design. So, a pretty boy in leather pants and a crop top jacket, that's kind of an awkward fit for a Lich King, isn't it? But Viego isn't a Lich King. Well, he commands an army of the undead, but what he is is a broken-hearted self-obsessive, accidentally invested with the power to make his issues everyone else's problem. Hence the black mist that pours from his literally broken-hearted chest, which is the source of all his powers. Viego looks probably too modern for League of Legends, frankly, but the point of his ridiculously exaggerated pretty boy good looks are similar to the point of Evelyn's hypersexualized look. To show, visually, how someone could fall for him and be blind to all his red flags. He's a monster, yes, but he's a monster who loves you. In game, his ability to mind control enemies stands in for his narcissism and privileged entitlement over the lives of others. In his character design, his sex appeal stands in for the seductiveness that makes Isolde fall for him, and the charisma that makes people enable him, indulging his whims and wants until his ego becomes the end of the world. I do wish he looked less modern and more fantasy-like, and maybe a little bit more visually monstrous in contrast to his sexy good looks, but as a design, on his own terms, he works. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Okay, so Victor has a very long and very involved lore, but TLDR, he's a scientist from Zon who is obsessed with transhumanism. A, trans rights. Basically, he tried very hard to do science to stop people from suffering, but because people have feelings and stuff, they keep getting into more suffering, so he decided to get rid of all emotions, starting with himself. Turns out, though, that having emotions are also part of what gives you ethics and empathy, and now Victor has decided that people are gonna get turned into cyborgs pretty much whether they want it or not, because glory is evolution. His nemesis is Jace, sort of. They have the sort of hate-respect-hate relationship that's great for shipping, although Victor at this point thinks himself above petty rivalries because beep boop robot brain, although reading between the lines, he seems to be wrong about that. As a design, Victor is a bit underwhelming, like he's supposed to be this avatar of cyborg supremacy, but pretty much all he's got is like one extra armor glowing mask and a cyborg arm replacement. Urgot is more cyborg than he is, and he got put together in a cave with a box of scraps. Victor remains visually far, far too ordinary a human for his story. If he's an extremist for his beliefs, it sure ain't showing. Give him a rework and show us that glorious evolution, Riot. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ah, Vladimir is old, and not just his crusty-looking character model. He began life as an indentured servant to a Darkin during their dark reign, and managed to learn enough of blood magic and arcane power not only to successfully slay his ascended master, but to use the magic to renew his flesh over and over and persist for centuries into the founding of Noxus, where along with LeBlanc he became the leader of the Black Rose cult. He's less interested in the political machinations of the Rose, though, than he is in a Dorian Grey-style ultra-hedonistic vampire lifestyle, reveling in pleasure and butchery for a century or two before fading into history to be forgotten. For all the scheming that goes on around him, Vladimir is only ever out for himself. As a design, he is, yeah, I mean, look at him. My man looks like a depressed onion at a renaissance fair. He has the affect of an eccentric aristocrat, sort of, in his outrageous outfit, but he ultimately just looks kind of silly. And not in a disarming way that would let him get close enough to suck your blood, just silly. His character model does him no favors, but broadly, I think he needs to be sleeked down and given a clear visual aesthetic direction, rather than just shotgunning vaguely aristocratic looking details all over him with a trebuchet. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Volibear is one of the old gods of the Freljord, brother to Anivia and Orn, and a crusty old survivalist boomer who wants you to know that in his day they went to slaughter their enemies in the snow uphill both ways. He's the spirit of the storm, a blood-soaked rush of brutality and violence on two legs, who sees the Freljord, especially the Avarosans, attempting to transition to a more peaceful way of life as a betrayal of the spirit of the land. To Volibear, only strength and brutality gives you the right to survival, and he channels his divine power through spirit mediums to not only preach his cruelty, but enforce it with mind control. Such is the power of his command that even Sejuani, who has allied with him, has trouble resisting his call. He's 
He's responsible, among other things, for blinding Lysandra and murdering Orn's followers, for which his brother will never forgive him. As a design, Volibear is an ode to keep it simple, stupid. He's a magic lightning baron, that's exactly what he looks like, with some rune-studded braids, magic claws, and glowing eyes. His ability to sprout literal lightning rods from his back gives him the exact right amount of otherworldliness to make him look godlike, and his penchant for walking upright makes him exactly human enough to look sentient without making him look too much like a furry. I still think the Thousand Pierce Bear was a cooler concept, but oh well. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. I just can't shake the feeling it's pronounced Warwick. Warwick is an ex-gangster who tried to put away the violence and seek a better life, but he had the misfortune of crossing paths with Singed. He doesn't know why or how it happened, but Singed used him as a test subject, carving, cutting, poisoning, and regenerating him over and over and over again until he died. Singed throws his corpse in a toxic swamp, but then the experiment works. Warwick revives and becomes fully the wolf monster Singed intended him to be. He craves blood and flesh, but driven by the guilty memories of his past, he kills only those who are already covered in the stench of blood, hoping instinctually that his hunts purge only the worst of Sans killers. Also, he's probably connected to Vine Jinx somehow, but we don't know how. Exactly. Surrogate dad, perhaps? Who can say? As a sign, Warwick is slightly chimeric, incorporating a little bit of visual influence from other animals, but mostly he is a werewolf, and a pretty standard one at that. Put him next to a World of Warcraft worgen, you'd be hard pressed to tell a big difference. Warwick's big party trick are the chemical tanks on his back and the tubes flowing into his body, marking him out as a Frankenstein's monster werewolf, a science experiment, and a victim of abuse, not merely a monster by nature. And it works, he's a solid design. The little twist of the chemical tanks makes him special, and I really like it. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in depth videos. Ah, Sun Wukong from Journey to the West, the character who's in every MOBA game. Wukong is an Ionian Vestaya, a prankster and a kind of a little s*** by nature. He managed to get himself alienated from his tribe, the Shimon, with his constant crying wolf games. When Noxus invades Ionia, however, Wukong is humbled by the scale of destruction and seeks out the village of Wuju to learn their fighting skills so he can defend his home. But the Wuju masters are all dead to Noxian chemical weapons, and only Master Yi remains, and he won't take students. Wukong is persistent, though, showing up every day to challenge the master, and eventually his irascible personality and undeniable potential wins out over Yi's self-imposed exile, as Yi realizes that all Wukong really wants is chance to save his home, the one thing Yi was never able to do. Now they're student and master traveling Ionia to defend it from injustice wherever they may find it. As a design, Wukong is, well, he's a version of the Monkey King from Journey to the West. His design pretty much fully ignores his lore and rune terror as a whole, and focuses on making a cool MOBA version of the Monkey King, which, eh, you know. Personally, I think he looks way too bulky and clunky for his agile monkey trickster concept, and his design lacks any sense of playfulness. He could really use a sleeker and more mischievous redesign. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Can't have one without the other, so Cyan Rakan is a two-parter, this is the lore. Cyan Rakan are Lothlin, bird Vestaya from a group of Vestaian tribes for whom the wild magic of Ionia is particularly important to their survival. Humans encroach on their lands, offering treaties to preserve the flow of magic despite their settlements, and then humans break those treaties when their need for expansion overcomes their fidelity to pacts and agreements. The wild and free magic of Ionia is thus damned and enclosed, driving the Vestaya out of their ancestral lands and killing their culture. Thank god League of Legends is not a political game, or you might think this story is trying to say something. Rakan responds to this by aggressively asserting his culture, he's a bard, a poet, a battle dancer, stubbornly determined the coexistence must be possible. Then he meets Zaya, the first of a thousand men and women not to fall for his charms. Zaya is a militant, and as far as she's concerned, the magical desertification of Ionia caused by humans is an existential threat that must be met with force. In Rakan, she finds a partner who can support her and also push back against her most murderous impulses. In Zaya, Rakan finds someone who can give him a mission and a way to save his people through action. They're two halves of a whole, literal lovebirds. So in love that it's almost disgusting, but you look at them and you can see why. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Can't have one without the other, so Cyan Rakan is a two-parter. This is the character design. Cyan Rakan love birds, quite literally. Based in part on Birds of Paradise, a set of species within which the males put on incredibly elaborate displays of color and choreography, while the females are typically more drab and restrained and highly critical of their mates' performances. And in parts, this works really, really, really well. Rakan is the loud, hyper-confident, oversexed himbo, throwing his bright colors around, and Saya is the dour, downbeat, precision killer with darker colors and much less flash. In other ways, it works a lot less well. They're designed to be complementary opposites, night and day, yin and yang, but both of them are hot humans in bird cosplay. This is fine for Rakan, the charmer, the human-facing hot himbo dime piece, but then Zaya, his opposite, is also a hot human? She's an attractive, skinny, almost entirely human girl with Ari face, and given that her whole thing is rejection of humanity, it's counterproductive to me that her design doesn't take advantage of the fact that the Vestaya can be full furries and make her more animalistic, both to make her a greater, more explicit contrast to Rakan and to alienate her from humanity a little bit to reflect her story. I think it's silly that League of Legends invented a whole race of furries only to make so many of its champions just humans with animal ears. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zerath is in two parts, starting with the lore. When the slave Zerath was a boy, his father was crippled during the construction of a monument to the Emperor's favorite horse. He was left in the sands to die slowly and in agonizing pain. Zerath's mother, in desperation, got Zerath taken on by an architect to save him from a similar fate. Zerath eventually meets Azir, last prince of the Imperial line, and an unlikely friendship blooms. Zerath becomes Azir's personal slave, saves his life, and with Azir's promise that when he's Emperor, the slave shall be free, ringing in his ears, Zerath learns a dark magic to kill any pretenders to the throne in the womb of the queen before they can be born. When all else fails, he murders the queen and emperor himself in desperation, all to ensure Azir's rise to power. When 
When Asir then refuses to fulfill his promise and free Zerath, whatever faith he had left in the Empire dies, and he steals the magic of Ascension as a last-ditch effort to finally seize his freedom. He succeeds, but causes a massive magical accident and is sealed away for a thousand years by Nessus and Renekton. Now freed, he has become fully corrupted and driven mad by power, determined to build a new empire with himself on the throne. Thank God League of Legends isn't a political game, I might have some choice words to say about portraying violent resistance by slaves against their enslavement as morally corruptive or somehow a worse danger than the enslavement they resist. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zerath is in two parts, this is the character design. And his design is both very clever and suitable, and a bit lacking. First of all, he's just an old champion. He's from 2011, 10 years ago, so he's a bit clunky. But more than that, nothing about Zerath's aesthetic suggests Shurima, and this is because Shurima didn't exist when he was created, but, you know, still. The conceit of a magical coffin that's containing him is also cool, but the vast majority of the time, to me, it doesn't look like a confining limiter on his power, it just looks like armor. It needs more chains, or bindings, or some greater sense of a device that's meant for imprisonment or restraint. On the other hand, Zerath's character is that of someone so abused by power his entire life that eventually power becomes the only hope he has to break free from that abuse. Setting my problems with his storyline aside, if we're doing a character who's completely corrupted by an obsession with power at all costs, a roiling storm cloud of energy only barely contained by a coffin is a brilliant way to both signal the death of the man that he was, and the way that his formerly complex nature has been flattened into a singular obsession with formless power for its own sake. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Akshan is a street kid from Shirima with a heart of gold, despite his many attempts to pawn it. Being raised among the downtrodden, he has a special hatred for rich and powerful bullies, making him the perfect recruit to fight the undead, apparently, because a light sentinel named Shadia takes him on as an apprentice. When she's murdered by local warlords because she tries to get them to rally against Viego's harrowing, Akshan picks up a forbidden weapon named the Absolver, which can use the life force of a murderer to bring his most recent victim back to life, and he sets out to kill every warlord in Shirima until he finds his master's killer. Oh, and also he's gonna fight the harrowing because he's a good kid, but it's more of a side gig to doing vengeance. As a design, Akshan is a classic rogue or scoundrel, handsome, sharp, and blatant sexualized, he's designed to leave wet spots in underwear for miles around, but only ever tease, never commit. This suits his story, although the vengeance angle is a little bit lost for me, and the blatant inspiration from Prince of Persia and Assassin's Creed gets a bit distracting. Like he puts on a white hood for stealth, Riot? Really? In the context of Riot's extreme push to make every champion appealing or sexy, which uh, I do have mixed feelings about him, but in and of himself, as a design, Akshan is very competently put together. The pieces work, and the whole is cohesive. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Xin Xiao is an Ionian who was taken as a slave by Noxians and eventually made a career in the fighting pits of Noxus, killing gladiators for the sport of the nobility. Eventually, Noxus calls the gladiators to the battlefield, and when Jarvan III of Demacia spares his life after a rout, Xin Xiao defects and pledges himself to the Demacian king instead. Thank God he isn't a mage, or they would have thrown him in a concentration camp. He becomes a seneschal, loyal retainer and caretaker to the king's family, and helps tutor a young Jarvan IV. And now, in the Mage Rebellion, he's more determined than ever to guide the young prince well through the grief of Jarvan III's death. As a design, Xin Xiao is, well, he's an example of the splash art strongly disagreeing with the model about what the character actually looks like. And the irony is that the lore says that Xin Xiao is a highly experienced older warrior who has lived decades of hard life before coming to Demacia, and that's what the model looks like, but the splash art seems desperate to have him try it for that boy band skin line everyone keeps expecting Riot to finally make. Outside of that and his eight-foot ponytail, though, he's just kind of normal. Like, he's as generic a Demacian spearman as Garen is a generic Demacian swordsman. It suits the character, I suppose, but it makes him really hard to get excited about. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Yasuo has a ton of complicated lore, but the really important bits you need to know are the following. He's the younger brother of Yonian, an impatient hothead who was assigned to guard a revered master. He decided to f*** off and fight Noxus instead, but when he came back, the master was dead and he was blamed for the crime. He fled to prove his innocence, but his brother Yone pursued him and Yasuo had to kill him. The guilt of that killing has haunted Yasuo his entire life, and even being cleared of the revered master's death has not stopped it haunting him. Even Yone coming back to life hasn't actually stopped it haunting him. Yasuo is eternally the unforgiven, because he refuses to forgive himself, and so he wanders the world forever, looking for peace that will only ever come from within. Or maybe he could try talking to his brother for more than, like, two consecutive voice lines. I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there, Riot. As a design, he's a solid mishmash of Ronin archetypes, inspired by Japanese history especially. His wild hair and scruffy appearance sells the idea of a shabby wanderer, but his elaborate shoulder guard and sword marks him out as more than just another faithless wandering drunk. His shirtlessness is maybe a little pandering, both to sexual and to power fantasies, but it's not blatant, and it does serve to sell him as a bit of a wild man character. Personally, I think Yasuo kind of rules. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Yone is the sensible, dutiful, and sober-minded brother of Yasuo, who spent his youth reigning in his wild younger sibling. When Yasuo is accused of murder, Yone is one of the people sent to bring him in, and Yasuo ends up killing him. Awakening in the spirit realm, Yone is attacked by an Azakana, a demon that feeds on negative emotions, and when he's able to fight it off with its own weapon, he awakens back in the material world with a mask of the Azakana's face unmovably attached to his. Through the mask, he can see these demons and resolves to hunt them to find answers about his fate. That whole bit about how his brother killed him and there's a huge unresolved emotional issue there, eh, no big deal, they speak two lines to each other and it's fixed, don't worry about it. As a design, if Yasuo is based on a 
classic Ronin samurai, then Yone is a classic demon samurai, wielding a blood-red blade that thirsts for the souls of spirits, wrapped in bandages and wearing an ominous mask. It's all very Shadow the Hedgehog anime edgy, especially with the floating bandages, but the character storytelling is solid. His language to seek and blood-red and dark against pale skin visuals tell you the kind of broody angst master that he is, and invokes classic imagery of demons and the undead. The shirtlessness is a bit gratuitous, maybe, but it all works. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. It seems these days everyone forgets Yorick Mori. A monk from the Blessed Isles who was blessed or cursed with the ability to speak to the dead, Yorick survived the ruination thanks to his gift and now lives on the Shadow Isles as a sole survivor of this order, plotting revenge against the Ruined King who destroyed his world, only to not actually do anything in the Ruined King event, which is a different and much longer video. He can speak to the dead and has found a way to command them, including the terrifying Maiden of the Mist, a ghost who haunts him with a loving menace, always tempting him to join her in undeath. It's a compelling dynamic. As a design, Yorick looks like what he is, a gravedigger monk. His ornate spade and the symbol he carries on his back gives him that air of religious devotion mixed with practicality. The bottle containing the water of life that keeps him alive hanging around his neck contrasts beautifully as an important bright spot in an otherwise very dark design. The dark hood he wears over his face also alienates him from the viewer a little bit, making him creepy and suggesting the dark things that he's capable of doing in his quest to end the reign of the ruined king. Which he didn't actually participate in ending. Seriously, Riot, what the fuck? Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Yumi is excellent, you're just salty she made you die to someone as lame as Garen. Yumi is a cat, a magical cat, the familiar of a yordle sorceress named Nora, with whom she lived a happy and peaceful life on the outskirts of Bandle City. Uncomplicated happiness is not allowed in League of Legends, though, and so one day Nora goes missing, having jumped through a series of magical portals in her magical book of thresholds. The book is sentient and tells Yumi that Nora has gone somewhere so perilous that she destroyed the portal behind her out of caution. Well, Yumi needs her snacks and cuddles, so this won't do, and she and the book sets out through the portals looking for their beloved missing master. As a design, Yumi and book are a cat and a book. There are little touches, like Yumi's golden whiskers and head-mounted gem and books elaborate I'm a magical fantasy book decorations and embellishments that ensure you're never going to mistake them for an ordinary cat and book. They are classic fantasy features in a novel combination, and while it isn't transcendently brilliant, it just works really well. Yumi is entirely designed around kitty cat adorableness. There's not a hint of edge or darkness anywhere in her, and I defy anyone to watch her interactions with book and not immediately adore their friendship dynamic. She doesn't count as a monster champion riot, but I'm glad you made her. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zack is in three parts, and the first is about his history. Zack is from 2013, and is one of those champions who were added to the game and then got completely ignored by Riot for almost a decade, until a relatively recent lore update fundamentally retconned huge parts of his story for no apparent reason. Once upon a time, Zack was the result of a Sonite Chem Baron's experiments to try and create a chemical super soldier. His creators, though a husband and wife duo of scientists, quickly grew attached to young Zack as his sentience began to develop, and decided to flee the lab, hide, and adopt him as their son. Thanks to his parents, Zack had a happy childhood free of most of the abuses of Zon, until the Chem Baron found his parents and threatened their lives if they did not return Zack to a life of imprisonment. Zack, infuriated by this, uses his powers to rout the Kim Baron's men and protects his family and, in the aftermath, realizes that his powers could protect so much more than just his own. With the blessing of his parents, he makes the decision to become a vigilante, defending the innocence of Zon from the abuses of the powerful. It's a good story. I like Zack's story. But then Riot decided to retcon into Batman for no good goddamn reason. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zack is in the three parts, part two is about his current lore. Zack began life as a chemical curiosity, a pool of liquid in Zon that seemed to respond to stimuli and have some kind of sentience. Zon alchemists were dispatched by a chem baron to experiment on it to see if it could be turned into a weapon. Two of the chemists, having ethical concerns, speared him away instead and end up adopting the developing creature as their child. Zack grows up exploring Zon through its networks of pipes and uses his powers to help people when they need it, becoming a local legend. And those altruistic actions lead the chem baron to find his parents. They surround their house and they murder them just before Zack can race home to save them. The anguish of their deaths sends him into a berserker rage, and when it's all over and he has destroyed half a city block, he resolves to live alone in Zon's sewers, still trying to help its citizens, but occasionally he gets so overwhelmed by the city's aura of negative emotions and pain that he emerges more as a raging monster than as a savior. And yeah, they turned him into Batman, broody vigilante struggling with violent dead parent trauma. Retconning Zack into something darker and edgier is one of the weirdest and least motivated retcons Riot has ever done, and for my money it makes the character actively worse. I'll explain how in part three. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zack is in three parts. Part three is about his design. Zack is a slime. He's a big goopy slime monster with a scary monster face. On top of that, he's visibly buff, which, you know, he's a slime monster. He doesn't have muscles, but he's intentionally made to look muscular to make him look stronger and more intimidating. And frankly, his design is not much to write home about. He's just a big evil slime monster with no bells and whistles. Who cares, right? Except Zack is essentially the reverse of Hans from Frozen. His design is clever because he's a handsome Disney prince who turns out to be a sociopathic villain. And Zack looks like a big scary monster, but he's actually a kind, gentle, playful, and friendly himbo who just wants to make friends and make people happy. That intentional massive disconnect between his 
design and story is the point of him, and it elevates his generic design to give it some pathos. Big scary monster man who's secretly gentle and just wants friends is a compelling archetype. Which makes it so baffling to me that Riot decided to Batman retcon him into a sewer-dwelling vigilante ticking time bomb that absorbs the pain and suffering of Zaun emotionally, and sometimes explodes in uncontrollable rage. It completely undoes the gap appeal of his original conception in order to make him just another angry edgelord with a revenge plot. Sack was unique, and Riot, for no f reason, decided to make him less interesting. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Yeah, no, sorry, but Seth's story can be covered in just one short, so it's another three-parter. Zed is a poor kid from Ionia who worked as a lowly servant of the King Hu Monastery until one day Master Kusho decides to teach his son Shen a lesson by telling him to beat the crap out of poor Zed until Zed finds an opening and lands a hit. Zed is taken in by Kusho and races an apprentice alongside Shen and the two become close, closer than friends, closer than brothers. In case you're wondering, yes, a queer reading of their relationship is extremely valid, actually. Then in their apprenticeship, Jin begins his gruesome murder spree and the trauma of investigating his killings begins to drive a wedge between the two friends. Shen adopts his father's religious detachment to cope while Zed becomes ever more driven by a desire for preventative action. That wedge is then fully exploded when Noxus invades. Shen and Kushu favor traditional dispassionate peace, but Zed demands action, and in desperation, he obtains forbidden shadow magic and kills Kusho, rallying much of the Kinku and many Ionians to his new order of shadows, hoping to save Ionia from Noxian domination and build a new tradition of interventionism from the ashes of the Kinku. Or at least that used to be a story. There's a twist in part two. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zed is in three parts, part two is about the big twist in his story. So as the Zed comic Ride published with Marvel reveals, we only know half the story of Zed's fall to the shadows. The aftermath of Jin's grisly serial killing drives a wedge not only between Shen and Zed, but between Master Kusho and his ideals. He suggests that Zed take up the forbidden shadow magic and pretend to murder him, so Kusho can control the Navori Brotherhood in secret and defend the nation without staining the honor of the Kinku. Fast forward a decade and Kusho has become far too used to power. He releases Jin to sow terror and frighten the population into uniting under his banner, and wildly abuses the power of shadow magic. Zed tries to manipulate Shen into discovering his father's betrayal, but when that fails and Shen kicks his ass, he returns to the Navori Brotherhood and kills Kusho himself, finally committing the crime that Shen always blamed him for. Personally, I think it kind of sucks that Zed's agency in his own story got reduced to League of Legends Palpatine made me do it, rather than being driven by his own decisions, but at least we've got tons of Shen and Zed getting angsty over how much they care for each other. We'll talk to Sign in part three. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zed is a three-parter, and we finish up with the design. So, who likes Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? While well, it may be League of Legends Anakin in the story, Zed's design owes a lot more to the Shredder, with his elaborate grey armor spikes and ominous red-eyed metal mask. Yes, he's created to embody an archetype and not to challenge it, and the archetype here is Evil Ninja Master. So, where Shen broadly has more gentle curves and a bulkier, more rounded armor, Zed is all about the spikes and sharp edges. They also contrast each other in a classic red-oni-blue-oni duality, with Zed's reds denoting both his more passionate personality and the bloody violence he prefers. When unmasked, and I honestly still kind of wish Riot never unmasked him, he has a bit of that classic anime boy prettiness with white hair, dark rimmed eyes, and orange irises. Or at least he does when he's not drawn in the overhatched style of a Marvel comic. <clears throat> While he's hardly skinny, he is, out of game at least, a bit more wiry than Shen, the twonk to his hunk, if you will. Zed doesn't reinvent the wheel of the evil ninja master by any means, but especially in context with Shen, he's a brilliant bit of contrast work to his boyfriend, I mean his best friend. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Ziggs is Yordle who loves explosions, and I could kind of end the short right there because there's not that much more to him. Except, of course, that one time when he was canonically dating Jinx for a weekend. Ziggs, like his fellow chaotic Yordle Rumble, has never had his lore properly updated, and so his story is thin on the ground. He's a Yordle who's obsessed with making things explode, and while theoretically he used to run an inventor shop business with Heimerdinger, I personally question how canon that story is anymore, given the wild inconsistency with which Yordles and their place in Piltover is portrayed. Are they cryptids or not, Riot? It's past time you clarified. Anyway, as a design, Ziggs is pretty simple, as Yordles with their squat bodies often have to be. His primary design features are his goggles, his enormous Cheshire Cat grin denoting his manic and chaotic nature, and the giant cheerful red bombs he carries with him. And while I appreciate that the guy is actually wearing something that at least looks like a sensible protective armored blast suit given how he throws explosives around, the primary storytelling of his design is that Ziggs is a Yordle who loves explosions, which, to be fair, is exactly what it needs to be. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Mundo is a terrible, dark tragedy, a good man done wrong by an evil social order, suffering a cruel fate that speaks heavily of man's inhumanity to man. And he's also a hilarious, silly cartoon clown character, a bizarro doctor who says funny lines about doing medicine wrong in a comedy way. <laughs> what a big silly. Yeah, I'm saying this champion has tone problems. Mundo was once a kind of dim-witted, decent man making his way in Son the only way a big man with few prospects can as an enforcer for a Son Kim Baron. After making one too many mistakes, the Baron, in a show of spectacular cruelty, has him forcibly committed to an asylum where he's 
he's gruesomely experimented upon and tortured. Which, of course, makes him go cartoon comedy crazy. <laughs> this tone problem persists in his design, which on the one hand tries to be cartoonish and whimsical, on the other hand has him running around in a torn straitjacket with horrible biological experimentation pods sticking out of him, and then also on top of that tries to make him a big, hot, sexy hunk man. In my opinion, the Mundo update suffers from a catastrophic lack of clear direction. It tried to be everything to everyone and ended up being a highly polished, well-animated mess. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zillion, you are old. You are so, so old. One of the earliest champions added to the game, time has not been kind to the Chrono Keeper, although his story has held up surprisingly well. Zillion is one of the last living Ikathians, a master of time magic. He saw the tidal wave of the Void unmaking Ikathia before him and evacuated as many people as he could into his wizard's tower, and then he cast a spell to remove it from time altogether. Now trapped outside of time, Zillion has spent unknowable eons with the other Ikathian survivors, studying the flow of time to find a way to undo what happened to Ikathia and protect the world from the Void. But despite sifting through millions of timelines, he's yet to find even one that leads to salvation. As a design, Cillian is terrible, a clunky, mal-designed mess with onion hair and a steampunk cuckoo clock on his back. He looks less a revered wizard and more like a rejected puppet from a TV show that teaches children to tell time. Legends of Runeterra, of course, has updated him quite excellently, giving him wizardly dignity and updating his clock mechanism to a properly mystical and shereman design. In game, in League of Legends, though, he's a reminder that Riot has always had trouble doing proper maintenance on their roster. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Zoe is adorable, you're all just salty, you can't dodge her skill shots. Zoe is the Targonian aspect of Twilight, the spirit of imagination, mischief, and change. She was once a young human girl, an absolute urchin, playing pranks and skipping school to chase her bliss among the mountains, and those qualities drew the attention of the aspect to her. It opened a portal to the wonders of the universe below a cliff in front of her, and she dove in, cheerfully laughing, determined to see what was on the other side, and in that moment she ascended. She's been an aspect for more than a thousand years, but she is still a child, never surrendering the youthful innocence that powers her imagination. Never doubt, though, that despite the lol so random humor and whimsy, Zoe has the power to unmake mountains with her mind. As a design, Zoe is deeply Disney, copying from the Disney Pixar canon those big round eyes and tiny button nose. This also makes her remarkably expressive, which is reinforced with her fantastic animation. Her clothes are simple, and she has a few bracelets and trinkets, like the keys she once stole from Fiddlesticks of all people. But the big showpiece of her design is that floating trail of red and pink hair that trails away into starlight. More than anything else, that's what lets you know that Zoe is not an ordinary little girl, and it works brilliantly. Subscribe to this channel for more reactions and hot takes, or head on over to my main channel for longer in-depth videos. Theoretically, Syra is a monster. She originates in the southern jungles of Shirima, beginning life as a carnivorous plant entity empowered by latent elemental magic. One day, a sorceress and her expedition enter Syra's territory, and as Syra's plants attack them, the sorceress accidentally ignites the magics of the area with a spell, leading to an enormous magical cataclysm that wipes out everything except Zyra. She emerges changed from the cataclysm, empowered with a new sentience, capable of taking on a traveling form, but still consumed with the fundamental desire of a creeping vine to spread and grow, overtake and choke and consume all other things. She stalks the land like a monstrous avatar of untamable nature, spreading her seeds and devouring all in her path. Although you'd be forgiven if you don't get any of that from her design, where she's a hot lady in Poison Ivy cosplay. Now, Poison Ivy is often cast as a seductress, an alluring carnivorous plant whose beautiful flower hides deadly venom, and as such, a sexualized design often works for her. Zyra is not that. In her story, she's a sentient plant monster obsessed with consuming the world with her roots, and the design that works for Poison Ivy doesn't work for her. She's hot, and I like looking at her, but it's bad storytelling. And holy shit, that's all of them. A short for every single champion. Thank you all so much for listening. And somehow, that's all of them. If you are a madman and you've watched this far, hey, leave a comment with your favorite Shakespeare quote, or a poem that you like, or a train emoji, because trains are nice. Thank you very much for watching. You can subscribe to my Shorts channel if you like. I have a Let's Play channel, I have a Patreon, a merchandise store, and a chip jar, and if you want to support me through any of those, it's very helpful, it helps me pay my rent and stuff, but if you don't want to, or you're not in a position to be able to, please don't worry about it. I hope you enjoyed this compilation. Please remember still to wear a mask and wash your hands, take whatever vaccines are necessary to make this goddamn pandemic go away, and try to act with solidarity towards those who are worse off than yourself. <laughs>